Hi everyone. Good morning. Just give us a minute and we'll we'll start in a second. We'll just let a few more people join. All right, we might get started then. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, these are our lectures today. So if you if you have if you know happen to know the answer to this question, please feel free to pop in the chat and we'll be giving out prizes today as we go as well for anyone that's got their camera on. If you ask any questions in the chat or if you answer questions that the lecturers ask you, Maddie might have a few questions for you. Um, and also if you just just interact with us, we'll give you a prize. We have $150 worth of prizes to give away. So I hope I hope you guys get a few of those. Um let me just go to the next slide. Just before we start as well, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, traditional owners of the land in which we're all meeting today um, and just extend my uh, respects to their elders past and present, as well as acknowledging any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present here today. Um, so the sort of run sheet for today is we're going to start off with cardiology and Maddie's going to take us through that. And then we're going to move on to rest and ENT um, and then move through neonatology, have a break for lunch, and then I'll take you through um, MSK and neurology at the end. Uh, but if at any point you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I put a link to the, the slides in the chat, um, and I'll sort of keep updating that file. So before each lecture, um, the slides will be uploaded. So um, if, if, if that works for everyone. But you should be able to access Maddie's cardiology um, lecture slides there now. If anyone's having trouble or anything like that, feel free to shoot me a message. But I'll let Maddie take over now. Hi everyone, um, nice to see you all here on a Saturday. Thanks for coming. I know Saturdays aren't the greatest time to do a bunch of studying, but we'll we'll start off with Pete's cardio. I'm assuming we can all see my screen and I'm not sharing incorrectly. Cool, I'm gonna take 
that. Yeah, great. Awesome. Um, so in terms of questions, I'm really bad at using Zoom, so I'm not going to have the chat open. Nami, can you just yell at me? Or if anyone wants to yell at me, please do so while we whiz through these cardiology. I know it's quite a lot. Um, so we'll just get straight into it. So these are your core conditions. Um, I like to break it up into <clears throat> congenital heart diseases and infective. <laughs> Obviously, only got two and infective. Um, and they have those little red flags um, kind of next to some of your core conditions. I don't really know if that means you have to take particular notice of those, but I've just put them in red. Um, so then with your congenital heart diseases, I like to break it up into your cyanotic and your acyanotic. Um, you will notice that there is quite a lot more in the cyanotic. I've only put those there because I remember cardiologists would mention a bunch of these and they would be in your lectures and I'd be like, do I have to know these? They're there for completeness. Please don't stress about them. I will breeze over them. If we've got time, we can come back to them. Um, it's just more so if they pop up in a multi-choice, you've kind of seen them before. But like, I remember seeing total, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, like, what, what is this? Um, you don't really need to know it. Just focus on the two main um, R1s for your cyanotic. And then you've obviously got your A cyanotic as well. Cardiac failure, I don't really know what they want you to know for this because obviously your cyanotic and your acyanotic can lead to heart failure. So I guess that's kind of really just what you need to know. Heart failure presents the same, really impedes as it does in adults. So your heart failure signs, your fluid overload, just be kind of noted, like noteworthy for that, I guess. Um, we'll do a quick pathophys so you kind of understand what's going on with your congenital heart diseases. So with acyanotic, um, you've got a left to right cardiac shunt. So the left side of the heart has higher pressure. So blood will want to flow through the defect to the right side of the heart because it's of a lower pressure. So oxygenated blood will go from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. Oxygenated blood will recycle through the pulmonary, um, pulmonary system. So no deoxygenated blood will enter into the systemic system. This is why they're acyanotic, so they, they'll present quite well. This is different to cyanotic. You're probably asking, well, why is there a right to left shunt if it, the right side is low pressure? Good question. These cyanotic conditions, um, are, the defects are quite large. So we'll get to why there's a right to left shunt, but just note that the defects are so large, they've caused the pressure to shift. So the pressure generally in the right heart, part of that right heart will tend to be larger. So the pressure gradient is reversed. So blood is still going from the higher pressure to the lower pressure system. So it'll go from right to left. Um, Deoxygenated blood will go from the right side of the heart into the left side and will enter into the systemic system, which is why we have science. Um, these are the general clinical features. So if you ever see general clinical symptoms or features on a slide, refer back to this because you don't want to have to list this out every time I came across a condition. Um, for your acyanotic babies, they do present quite well. They're pink, normal skin tone. And they can have kind of like failure to thrive if their condition is more on the severe end of it. We do know this is a, like a spectrum of disease. So you can have very minor acyanotic that have also quite severe acyanotic that kind of does verge on more like cyanotic presentations. You can have failure to thrive, recurrent bronchial pulmonary infections because it will go from the right, left to right and enter into the pulmonary system. So you've got fluid overload in the lungs, which is why you've got more infections. Exercise intolerance. Um, please note that this is not exertional dyspnea. This is just like fatigue. When doing like exercise, you might have a three-year-old that runs around and just gets a little more tired than other three-year-olds. Um, versus your cyanotic babies. These are very unwell babies. So they will be gray, bluish kind of skin tones, really bad feeding problems. These will tend to also present in like a few days to weeks of, of life. Failure to thrive. When I say exertional dyspnea, this means anything, anything at all. So crying, laughing, um, defecating will cause them to become breathless. So this is how severe these defects can be. Um, obviously, um, tachymeric, fatigue, hop, um, hypoxemia, heart failure signs because of the, the, how bad the defects are, and clubbing, which tends to be more late side, um, later stages in life. You will already know about the defect by this time. 
Um, in terms of when you kind of when you're going through your congenital defects, there's a kind of a general system I like to kind of approach this with. How do babies present? Um, and then their like mem like what is their specific mama? Then when you get to investigations, it tends to be really similar across all of them. Echocardiogram will be the gold standard to diagnose all of these. If there is a specific EC um, chest X-ray, I will note it down for you. There will be specific findings for all of them, but the big ones are really for your cyanotic diseases. ECG, there will be findings, but it's really specific, so don't worry about it. Management, um, there's two there's two things you need to think about. Can this baby be left alone and can they be just monitored? Will the defect close or is it not a severe defect? Do you, Or do they need surgery? And if they do need surgery, can they be left a few years until they're big enough to kind of handle surgery properly? Or is this a really sick baby that needs surgery? So that's kind of the biggest thing about congenital heart defects. We'll start with um, acyanotic because they're a bit easier to wrap your head around. So we'll start with the holes in the heart. Um, so um, atrial septal defects, very obviously what it sounds like, a defect in the atrium. There's kind of two different types. I don't really know how like specific they need you to be about it. Um, ASD1 is other, especially with other congenital ones, but ASD2 is the one that usually occurs in isolation. You'll see this in adults. Um, risk factors, this is an R1 condition, so I would recommend knowing your risk factors. Females greater than males, Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome as well pops up here and there. Um, and um, Holt um, Omar syndrome as well. Again, pathophys, left to right shunt, more blood in the pulmonary system. Over time, please note this is over time. It doesn't happen in the first few weeks to life. Um, pulmonary hypertension, right ventricle hypertrophy. So that's kind of the consequence of a left to right shunt. Um, presentation, it's based on severity, but they tend to be acyanotic and asymptomatic as a child. Um, this note here is really for those that whose ASD doesn't close as a child. So for those who have like large ASDs that don't close, around 40, 90% of those patients will have symptoms of a heart failure, shortness of breath, infection, and will present. Um, so examination, um, they'll have a systolic ejection murmur over the second intercostal space, a widely split S2, which is fixed. It won't change with inspiration. This is due to the extra blood flow, flow through the atrium. Um, and then uh, clinically, again, it's based on severity, but they will generally be well. Um, investigations, echo, chest X-ray, um, and ECG. Those are the findings. It's not really super important for those, this one. Um, management, monitoring, most um, ASDs will close, especially if they're small. Surgery, um, large ASDs will need to be repaired via a patch, but they can be left. So this is an important one. They can be left until they're a bit older. Cardiac surgery is a huge operation for kids. So if they can be left, leave them until they're a bit older to handle it. Um, the only consideration you want to know is if it's, if it's like, if they're symptomatic or if they've got a dilated right atrium. So if it's causing symptoms or it's impacting the heart, that's when you might move the surgery up. Um, complications, this is one that's really kind of seen in adults because you've got that hole. If you do get an embolism from like a DVT, it can cross straight into the left side of the heart and then enter into the systemic system. So you can get strokes and um, embolisms in um, throughout the body. Um, and then obviously heart failure, which is a complication from your left or right shunt. Um, VSDs. Very, very similar hole in the ventricle. This is a, probably a nice picture of the left kind of right shunt happening here. Genetically, um, genetic associations, Downs, Edwards, and um, Pateau syndrome. Um, risk factors are, again, are a bit different. Orch infections are huge. Um, maternal diabetes, obesity, and smoking while pregnant. Again, very similar left to right shunt, pulmonary hypertension, um, hypertrophy of the um, right ventricle. Again, presentation, it's based on severity, um, but asymptomatic asy and asymptomatic. If it's severe, they will kind of present with symptoms earlier on, um, but yeah. Um, examination, a bit different from your ASD. Harsh holosystolic moma over the left, left lernal, uh, lower sternal edge, a mid-diastolic moma over the apex. So they're gonna have two. It's mid-diastolic member because um, it's the ventricle and it's, it's filling during diastole. 
that's why you're going to have a murmur there, um, and allowed S2 if pulmonary hypertension, so not always present if it's there. Again, well, if based on the type of severe they are. Large VSDs, they can present with heart failure symptoms within two to three months because it's the right ventricle that's being directly impacted. So if it's really, really bad, it's going to be impacted straight away versus an ASD, which has to kind of go through the atrium first. Again, same things, echoes your gold standard. There are some findings with chest X-ray and ECG. They're there if you want to know them. Monitoring, small VSDs can be, again, close spontaneously, patch, um, surgical repair. Again, if you can leave it until they're older, two to three years, you will do so. But if they have heart failure in two to three months, you'll repair it straight away. So it's, again, based on severity. Complications are your ventricle hypertrophies, arrhythmias, infection, because you're damaging the heart, um, and heart failure. Atrial um, ventricular septal defects. It's not on your matrix. I'm just, it's there for completion. It's a combination of um, the atrium and ventricle septals like not meeting. The only difference here is that the tricuspid and mitral valves actually like might not join. So you can kind of see it here. This is the valves. It's like one giant valve instead of two separate valves because you don't have like a joining wall here. Um, again, right to left shunt, increased pulmonary hypertension. Um, based on disease severity, again, they do tend to be well, um, then more severe cases will present in six to eight weeks. Again, because it's quite a big defect. Um, systolic heave, ejection systolic murmur, mid-diastolic rumble or uh, murmur, because again, it's affecting the ventricles as well. Um, parts can close as they grow up, but they most likely will need a surgical correction of whatever hasn't been, um, what kind of doesn't grow because it's also affecting the valve. Um, patent um, ductus arteriosus. Um, so this is a failure of the ductus arteriosus to close postnatally. 90% of these cases are actually isolated defects, so there won't be anything else happening. Uh, risk factors is prematurely at uh, premature <laughs> prematurity because the um, PDA is kept open by prostaglandins. So if you are born early, your body's not ready to close it. So the prostaglandins are still going to be um, in your circulation. So it's just going to be kept open. Respiratory distress syndrome and Down syndrome are the other ones. Maternal exposures. Um, Rubella is a really big one for this. Alcohol exposure consumption um, in a talent and prostaglandin use. If prostaglandins keep it open, if you're using prostaglandins while pregnant, it's going to be a risk factor for keeping it open once born. Again, you've got that left to right shunt, um, pulmonary hypertension. But because it's outside of the heart, you're not going to impact the ventricles. So that's important to note. If, it, if they say, oh, they've got pulmonary hypertension, but the ventricles aren't impacted, it's probably a PDA. So if you've kind of done, if you've seen this kind of syndrome before where you're kind of doing a bit of study and you're a bit confused, I totally understand. I was a bit confused by this as well. So technically, Elzenminger syndrome can occur in all left to right shunts. Um, so this can occur in your ASDs and your BSDs as well. So what happens is um, over time, because you're shunting more blood into the pulmonary system, the pressures will gradually increase over time. And it will increase to such an extent that the right side will have higher pressures than the left side. So the shunt will reverse. So you'll have blood flowing back from the right side to the left side. So you have a right to left shunt. So that's what the syndrome is called. What this means is you'll now have deoxygenated blood entering into the systemic circulation, causing cyanosis. This will occur really only if the acyanotic conditions are really severe um, and will kind of present more later on in the child's life. So this is like if a child presents with cyanosis early on in the first few days to weeks, it's not going to be this syndrome. It's more likely in like a few like months if it's a severe acyanotic condition or like years. So keep that in mind in terms of your duration. Um, what this will cause is because of where the PDA is, it's going to cause something called differential cyanosis. Because it's after the aortic arch, you have all oxygenated blood going off to the um, essentially top half of the body, 
and mixed blood going to the bottom half. So you're going to have cyanosis only in the lower limbs. So this is a really good key way of picking up between um, like a PDA, a really bad PDA versus a true cyanotic condition like a TOF or a, like a trans, like a TGA. So keep that in mind as well. Um, presentation, small PDAs, acyanotic, asymptomatic, large ones, they'll have those general acyanotic kind of symptoms that might prompt people to do a bit more investigations, examinations. Large PDAs will have a loud, continuous murmur loudest at S2 because it's a like an open kind of tube that's outside of the heart it, and has constant flow through it it's going to be a continuous murmur and it's loud at S2 because that's when more blood is pumped through the systemic. You'll have bounding peripheral pulses and differential diagnosis, which is only to the lower limbs due to where the PDA is located and only once the shunt's been reversed. So this is only really in really bad large PDAs. So this won't happen in small PDAs that will eventually close themselves. So yeah. Um, investigations, your standard ones, echo, Gold standard chest X-ray, um, ECGs, really just small and tiny. Um, management, Mo you can monitor small PDAs if there's no evidence of left sided kind of heart volume overload. It's fine, um, and you will treat with medications because NSAIDs like endomethacin will oppose the action of prostaglandins or PG ones. So, and will close the PDA. So this is really important. And this is often used in preterm infants because obviously surgery is not great for preterm pre infants. Sometimes they will ligate the PDA, but this is rarely done because medications like NSAIDs tend to be quite good at closing the PDA. Um, coarct coarctation of the aorta. Um, you're going to look at this and be like, oh my God, that's a right to left heart shot. Yeah, okay, it is. It's it's the one acyanotic condition that has a right to, uh, like a right to left heart shot. So Sorry about that. It's a spectrum and we like to put things in boxes and this is the one that just doesn't really fit anywhere. Um, so this is narrowing of the aortic isthmus, isthmus, which is after the aortic arch, which is really important because, again, it's after the arch, which means that any cyanosis is going to happen in the lower limbs. Um, so risk factors, females greater than males. So this is really linked with Turner syndrome. And in fact, um, five to 15% of all people with Turner syndrome will actually have coarctation of the aorta. So there's narrowing, which causes a lower pressure gradient um, downstream of the coarctation, which will cause, um, which is the PDA. The PDA will remain open in the first few weeks of life. And then the the right to left heart shunt will occur causing differential diagnosis because this is going to the lower limbs. It's really important to know as well that because the PDA will close a few weeks after birth, these kids can kind of present kind of okay if their coarctation isn't too big. So if it's like a mild coarctation, it could be asymptomatic. And then once the PDA closes, it could get much worse very quickly. Mild to moderate kind of severity, um, you'll have differential diagnosis at birth or when the PDA closes. So it can things can get really bad once the PDA closes because you've just got this really small amount of blood going through um, and that's what's causing the cyanosis instead of the mixing because you've just got no um, blood going through. Um, investigations, you'll have differential diagnosis of the limbs, brachial femoral delay because you have reduced blood flow going to the femorals. Weak femoral pulses, um, which this is very classic for your coarctation. Um, and then a strong displaced um, apex beak to the left. You'll have an ejection systolic murmur and a continuous plus or minus like a continuous murmur below the clavicle. Yeah. Kind of depends where it radiates, if it, if it radiates. This is the only one that has a different kind of investigation. Blood pressure is actually the best initial test for coarctation because it will show your brachial femoral delays. Um, echo is the best com like um, confirmatory test and it will show the location of your coarctation and your chest x-ray. There is a specific sign. It's a figure three 
on the x-ray um, and cardiomegaly. It's on the next slide I'll show you. Um, with your management, if it's a critical coarctation, which means it's really, really severe, you have to keep the PDA open, which is why you give an infusion of PGE1 of your prostaglandins, because that will keep the um, PDA open past three weeks. And then you'll do a surgery to correct it. So a balloon angioplasty, which will just open the vessel. Complications, um, you, you can get your aortic dissections, ruptures, you bend very aneurysms as well in your cranial arteries. So obviously these children are more prone to kind of more vascular complications as well. This is your figure three, because you've obviously got the coarct here. So it's like that figure three that you can see. So if you see that in your um, in your multi-choice, you know it's coarct. All right, so that is all of our um, acyanotic. So we'll go into our cyanotic. Again, there's only really two you need to know, which is your tetralogy of fallow and your transposition of the great vessels. So we might just skip through the other. The five others that I've put there, and you can just read the slides in your time. Um, so background for tetralogy of fallow, there are some genetic associations, down into George, the George's syndrome, maternal risk factors, diabetes, diabetes, um, alcohol consumption, and pheno, so yeah, that one. Um, <laughs> use. Um, so tetralogy of fallow is a collection of four congenital defects. Um, so here are your four. The first one is a right ventricle outflow obstruction. So essentially the um show you here. The yeah, the outflow tract into the pulmonary artery is narrowed for some reason, and this could include the valves. What this causes, um, and then this causes the second defect, which is your right ventricle hypertrophy. Um, your second one is a ventricle septal defect, which is allows the right to left shunt. This is because the right ventricle hypertrophy caused by your outflow obstruction creates um, the right ventricle to be at a higher pressure to the left side of the heart. So with your VSD, that's why you get the right to left shunt, which is why you get your deoxygenated blood moving into the left side of the heart and why you get um, cyanosis. And then you've got this overriding aorta. Yeah, you can't really see it. It's not really supposed to be this far down. It's kind of supposed to be kind of pushed up a bit. If you have to see. Um, so yeah, a key clinical feature here to note is that the degree of the outflow obstruction or stenosis here will determine how hypertrophied this right ventricle gets, which makes sense. If it's a higher degree of stenosis and obstruction, you'll get more um, hypertrophy, if it's not too bad, it won't be too um, hypertrophied. So this will then obviously dictate how high the pressure is and the degree of shunting and therefore the overall severity of the disease. If you have a really high um, degree of disease, you'll get a very big amount of shunting of deoxygenated blood into the left side of the heart and a worse presentation of cyanosis. This is a very minor um, stent stenosis, you won't get as much shunting, so the um, cyanosis might not be as bad. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of like just a regular one, and this is like just a regular BSD, and this is kind of the, the four showing kind of the um, pressure change. Again, a mild TOFs kind of will have, this is interesting, a mild TOF will kind of have like a left to right shunt and may present acyanotic until the disease worsens. So you can actually kind of have a acyanotic baby until it gets really bad, but they will get really bad really quickly. So yeah, again, spectrum of disease. They'll get really bad really quickly in the first couple of weeks. Um, presentation, um, mild again can be a like acyanotic and asymptomatic with general kind of symptoms, but it will progress quite quickly and they will become moderate to severe in within weeks because it's just such a um, the collection of defects is just so severe that the heart just won't get a code. So mild to moderate um, disease is they will be cyanotic and they'll be globally cyanotic. So they'll be cyanotic everywhere. Um, bluish, you know, around the fingers, mouth finger clubbing within months, plus the general kind of symptoms I talked about about cyanotic babies. They'll have test spells, 
um, which is like hypoxic episodes when they've kind of got um, increases in like physiological stress or psychological stress. So anytime they're kind of feeding, crying or have to like when they defecate, that's an increase in oxygen um, demand, which their body can't meet. So they'll have something called a TEP spell, which increases around two to four months when they're kind of starting to learn to do stuff. And what happens is they'll, this is like the physiology, I won't go over it unless you guys want me to later. They'll kind of go blue, they'll squat down and this kind of helps bring like blood back up into their heart, which is what a TEP spell is. So if they, if like a parent says they might have mild disease, it's kind of getting worse, they presented two months and the parent's going, oh, they kind of go a bit pale and then they squat down and then they kind of look better. That's, they've got tetralogy of fell like that. That's the only one that has fell. Examination, um, harsh ejection, systolic murmur on the left sternal edge, plus a loud single S2, um, plus or minus your right ventricular heave or systolic thrills, that's because of your right ventricular hypertrophy. Investigations, most of this is diagnosed prenatally, but again, in low research, in low resource settings, it might not be. Echo is gold standard to quantify how bad it all is. Um, there is um, a key finding on x-ray, it's a boot-shaped heart. Um, so if you see that in your question, it is tetralogy of fellow. And then you'll do your kind of other stuff as well management you will do a cardiac repair um, before the year before the first year of life because you want to prevent all these complications severe defects that will lead to severe hypertrophy and heart failure if it's not corrected so they will do the patch um, repair to stop the right to left shunt happening and cyanosis and then they will enlarge the um the obstruction um, of defect one to kind of stop the ventricle from hypertrophy more. Um, if it's really, really severe and these kids present cyanotic at birth, they'll give them a PG-1 infusion until surgery to keep the patent, um, the ductus um, arteriosus patent, um, because that will allow collateral blood flow. Um, and then obviously your doctor's ABCD. Yeah. Um, management of heart failures. Uh, you don't really need to know that that's just kind of there if you're interested. Um, so that's your test spells. This is a boot-shaped heart and a normal heart. So this is the interactive part. Does anyone want to tell me if it's left or right, um, the heart for um, Tetralogy of Fallow? Which one do you think is abnormal? Are we getting anything in the chat? <laughs> Nothing in the chat. Oh, Tiffany says it's on the right. Right. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it is on the right. So this is a normal um chest X-ray of a baby. Um, and this is the um boot check. You can kind of um yeah. So you won't have to pick. They won't give you an X-ray and be like, "What is this?" That's a bit mean. They'll just say boot shaped part on X-ray. Um, so the second cyanotic condition is um, the trans transposition of the great vessels or your great arteries. Um, it's just your swapped vessels and the sharp, the air, there's an egg shaped heart on it, right? So um, again, your maternal risk factors and exposure, you can think of this as Dan, Dr. Forty Dan. So you've got your diabetes, your rubella, age over 40, the George syndrome, alcoholic consumption and nutrition if it's poor, which is a bit of a... Um, so in terms of the defect, it's the anatomical reversal of the aorta and pulmonary arteries, which will create a closed circuit, which is incompatible with life, which is what you can see here. So these babies, if they're born just like this, they won't survive because the with like they do have uh, obviously blood support blood supply from the mother, but once they're born, that's obviously cut off, and this is just not viable with life. So they do need to have coexisting, um, like um, ab like defects in order for there to be blood mixing for them to survive. 
So they'll either have to have a PDA or a VSD or an ASD so that blood can mix. There is kind of two different TGAs. I don't think it's super important. This is the, the complete TGA is the one that most kids are born with. And they will have like the PDA VSD. This one here is the one that like kind of you can kind of get away with not being picked up, which I've just kind of included with um, the completeness. The reason it says compatible with life is that the defect is compatible with life. So they don't need extra defects to survive. So then they're not picked up until later on in life. And yeah, it's a, yeah, we'll see. Anyway, so this is the closed loop circuit um so then you need to have um kind of one of these to kind of survive um most cases will actually have a vsd um which will tend to be kind of the the most common one so that's your asd that's your vsd and that's your patent arteriosis um BD. um so presentation they'll postnatally they'll be cyanotic and it's not impacted by exertion or supplemental oxygen. So because, like, this is the mixing kind of of this, like, that this is the preset system and there's no way to increase your levels of oxygenation because the vessels have been swapped, if that makes sense. Um, so the oxygenation is determined by the mixing between the two circuits, which is determined by how many of these like collateral defects that you have, not by how much oxygenation you're getting from your lungs. So um, if these babies present cyanotic and you give supplemental O2, their stats aren't going to improve. They'll also be tachyneic as well. So on examination, they'll have a single loud S2. They won't really have a murmur. And they might have a small murmur if they've got a VSD, but they won't generally present with a murmur um, and they'll have dim diminished femoral pulse. Um, so that's the complete um, TGA. So they need to have um, yeah, other defects in order for it to happen. This is the one that is functional with life or compatible with life and doesn't have any other defects. What this kind of means is that the, the defect is that the ventricles are also and their valves are also swapped with the vessels. So the great vessels are still connected. Um, it's like, yeah, it's a bit weird. <laughs> Essentially, what this means is that it's called congenital, congenitally corrected so that circulation is preserved. Um, so what this means is that they will present asymptomatic and asymptomatic, um, and then they adults will be at risk factor, um, will have risk for failure. Really, don't worry about this one. That was just really put in there for completion if they put up random. Uh, anyway, for diagnosis, again, it will be found prenatally um, on facial ultrasound. Well, actually, it's actually difficult on facial ultrasound. It will most likely be picked up postnatally. Um, echo gold standard confirmatory test. This is the um, ECG. It's called egg on a string or an egg heart. It's bulging. Um, they'll have low O2 stats, and then you'll do an angiogram prior to surgery as well, just to kind of visualize the vessel. This is, again, they present cyanotic. They're not well babies. So doctors ABCD, you'll need to keep open the PDA for that collateral blood supply. So you do your PG. Um, E1 infusion, and then they will do like um, your corrective surgery. So they might even like enlarge an ASD or create an ASD um, to kind of keep things open um, while the child is becoming more medically stable. And then they'll do a surgical repair within the first two weeks. So they'll actually like swap the arteries back over, which is. Um, these are your other congenital defects. Again, this is just in here for completion. If you want to look at them or if people have like mentioned them, tricuspid atresia, the tricuspid valve hasn't like formed. Again, this is incompatible with life. You need a defect kind of, um, you need an ASD essentially um, and a VSD for it to kind of be functional. So you have your mixing of blood and 
etc. Same kind of things. Um, your truncus arteriosus, the um, aorta and pulmonary arteries don't um, split and diverge out in um, during development. So there's just this giant kind of trunk here, and that's where there's like this kind of mixing of blood. Um, and there's also like a VSD that doesn't close either because normally the vessels will kind of move up and the VSD will close. But um, obviously that's kind of what's there. Again, um, if both of those that I just mentioned will need surgical correction, they'll present cyanotic. This is this is a this is a lot. This is this is a bit of an annoying one. Um, total anomalous pulmonary return, venous return. Essentially, your pulmonary arteries, which return oxygenated blood, are supposed to come into the right atrium. They don't. It connects back into the venous system, which creates another closed loop circuit. So this is incompatible with life. You need an ASD to allow mixing. So you'll just have oxygenated blood coming from the lungs into the right side of the heart, going back into the lungs. So you need a um, an ASD for it to kind of enter into the left side. Um, again, those are your findings in these situation. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, the left side of the heart is just really, really small. The ventricle is just underdeveloped and this is not compatible with life because no blood is getting through the aorta. Um, most of these, all of these will have to have another deep of like a defect. Um, it will have to have an ASD and a PDA for it to be um, viable. So it needs to have blood getting into the right side of the body and then back into the left side for it to um, be compatible with life. Again, need surgical correction and a PGE1 infusion um, prior. Um, this Epstein's anomaly, anomaly is a very small ventricle because the tricuspid valve develops lower, which makes a very small ventricle. Um, and then that just kind of, yeah, it just is not very functional. So then you need to have an ASD in order to um, pump blood um, for it to be, um, to have the system work. Um, okay, so I know that was a lot. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left, so I will try to get through infected diseases in about 10. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, these are quite simple. They're very similar to your adult conditions. I would just know, um, try and know your antibiotics because um, they do kind of tend to up those. So your rheumatic fever, um, this is caused by a previously untreated group A strep. So your gas infections. Um, so the key here, it's, it's untreated. So it's previously untreated acute tonsillitis or your pharyngitis or strep throat. So ref, like you'll have an ENT lecture um, in a bit. So revise these conditions there. Um, it has to be untreated. If they've been treated, they won't, this pathophysiology won't happen. But if they're untreated, what happens is about two to four weeks, in these two to four weeks kind of post the gas infection, the, the body kind of amounts an immune response. The antibodies um, against the um, bacteria look very similar to um, and will be cross-reactive to nerve and myocardium protein, which is molecular mimicry and causes a um, type 2 hypersensitive reaction and acute inflammation. So this is why you see the um, kind of broad systematic, uh, systemic kind of signs. Peak incidence is five to 15 years, which is kind of when you get tonsillitis and strep throat. Risk factors are um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent, low FDS, crowded environments, genetics, and upregulated up -regulated TS, PNS, alpha. Um, so presentation, you'll have your constitutional symptoms, fatigue, malaise, fever, um, and then you'll have your Jones symptoms, which are here. You can, so J is for joints. So you'll have a migratory polyarthritis. So one joint, your large joints will be impacted and it'll be one after the other. So one joint will be large and inflamed and then it will seem to migrate to another large joint and then to another large joint. Which is a bit of a, is a clue to kind of 
um, rheumatic fever because it's a very weird presentation. O, <laughs> this is a bit of a, a bit of a funny one. O is for the heart, which is for pancarditis, which is um, inflammation of all three heart layers plus the valves. I'll go over that in a bit. N is for nodules, which are subcutaneous like nodules all over the body. There'll be erythema magnet. Yep. And then this other kind of like chorea twitching syndrome as well. In terms of history, symptoms will tend to appear two to three weeks after a previous infection or tonsillitis. So you'll have a parent come in and go, oh, my child's been well. And you'll have to ask, or have they been like recently sick? And they'll be like, yeah, they just had tonsillitis like three to four weeks ago. And that will be a sign that this might be rheumat like rheumatic fever. They'll be kind of well or wellish in between the time. There might be a bit of generally well. This is your diagnostic. There's a diagnostic criteria that you'll kind of use to see if this is rheumatic fever or not. Take it with a grain of salt, as you do with all diagnostic criteria. Um, you'll also do an FBE, um, your CRPs as well. You'll do a throat swab and a test for previous. Um, infection with gas so these are your for gas infections so these are your kind of um antibodies that you are testing for um you do an echo to see um if it's impacting the heart and then there's other kind of pathological findings as well um so these are kind of the symptoms that you'll see with pancarditis so you have obviously um endocarditis which is inflammation of the inner lining of the heart plus or minus mitral and aortic valve inflammation, which is important. It impacts really the high pressure valves more than the low pressure valves. Um, and these impacts may not be seen until later on in life though, but just be aware that it, like if they have a history of rheumatic fever as a child, they're more likely to suffer from um, kind of issues with these two valves later on in life. Myocarditis, it's really kind of more path finding. So if they put in like these kind of weird findings in like the um thing you'll know but you have to do like biopsies of the heart which no one does so you can kind of just ignore that and then you've got pericarditis which is inflammation of the um outer layer which causes pain and a friction rub on auscultation this is kind of showing you why there's like a friction rub because you've got two irritated layers rubbing against each other um so in severe like you can get severe valvular disease plus plus myocarditis will equal a dilated um, cardiomyopathy as well. So you can watch out for your um, uh, cardiomyopathy. So this is your skin and CNS. So your nodules are subcutaneous. They'll tend to be over the extensive surfaces of the arms and legs. They will be firm and painless, which is very key here. And they range from millimetres to centimetres. So that's kind of one there. That's like kind of another one like there. Um, they will be very benign looking um, and present with everything else. You'll have this very typical rash. They'll have like these kind of like rash that is like these light pink reddish rash that have a well-defined outer border and a central clearing. They'll be painless, non-puritic, um, and it'll be sparing the face. So you usually be on the limb and the trunk. And it's a really odd rash because it will be transient. So it can reappear and then like on different parts of the body. So it can appear in the arms, then disappear and reappear on like the limbs. So it's really important if you're taking a history from a parent in an OSCE to ask, do they have a rash? If they go, no, have they had a rash at all? Do they kind of look like circle or rings anywhere on their body at any point of the last like three to four weeks. So that's really important because it can go away. CNS, this is really kind of occurs one to eight months after infection. This is like these chorea movements, they're involuntary, irregular, non-repetitive movements of the leg, limbs, neck, head and face. They're just like twitching. Um, and this is really, really late in the disease. So you won't see this if they're presenting kind of acutely unwell so diagnosis um you've got your the jones criteria it's made up of major and minor criteria in the bottom of the slide it's like how many major and how many minor just don't really 
worry about that too much. But here, your major criteria are essentially the symptoms, the Jones symptoms, and then your minor criteria are like fever, raised ESR, CRP, and a prolonged um, PR interval because you've obviously got cardiac involvement. Diagnosis, oh, I put, I've actually put it there. Um, sorry, there's another one. That's in the criteria. There you go. You've got your, yeah, criteria there. Um, investigations, you need to prove that it's got a previous gas infection or it's not rheumatic fever. Other tests, um, FBE, CRP, ESR, throat swab, it may be commensal, so you can't rule in or out rheumatic fever based on the throat swab. Do your ECGs and an echo because cardiac is um, very likely involved. It's the most, it's the most susceptible um, part of the body to rheumatic fever, so you have to make sure that you're monitoring for cardiac involvement. And um, management, um, antibiotics, you need to eradicate the gas infection. Your, so because you need to eradicate the infection, your first line is your um, Benpen, single injection IM. Not a lot of people like this because it's a big injection into like IM muscle. But the second line therapy is penicillin B oral for 10 days. It's not optimal because you can't ensure people are gonna, will take it. And if they don't take the full course, they're likely to represent with more attacks of rheumatic fever. So this is why it's first line because it's a single dose. You can make sure that they have it. And then, then that's, they've cleared the infection. These are your second line kind of, if they've got allergies, they do, you know, take, take, take that with a grain of salt if they're going to ask you about penicillin allergies. Um, then you need to treat the, you know, arthritis and arthralgia symptoms, your NSAIDs. Um, naproxen is also another one that I forgot to consider um, when I was doing this research. So make sure like that that's on your list. Also ibuprofen um, and aspirin as well, apparently, but that's last line. Um, and then your like treatment comp like other things, if they've got the car like the like CNS involvement, um, you do need to treat that. But you're getting like, you know, involvement of like pediatric neuro you, you, neurologists at this point. So don't worry about that. Complications and prevention. If it's untreated, if you leave gas infections untreated, you will have risk of repeated rheumatic fever attacks, which will lead to lead to rheumatic heart disease. The heart tissue is the most sensitive to rheumatic fever attacks, and it's the most important prognostic factor in ca for cardiac involvement. Um, for uh, the most important prognostic factor is in like how bad someone is like going to have rheumatic fever or how bad their rheumatic heart disease is going to be is how many times they've had cardiac involvement through their rheumatic fever attack. So that's important. Um, so that's why you really need to kind of prevent and monitor for cardiac symptoms. Um, chronic rheumatic heart disease, you'll have inflammation of the valves, you'll have stenosis of the mitral and aortic valves, and severe value disease. Again, you have your dilated cardiomyopathy. So that's why you kind of want to prevent this because those are the complications. Prevention is um, quite long term. So secondary prophylaxis, you will have your Ben Pen IM every 21 to 28 days. When they stop this, it's like determined by a pediatrician, but they'll have to have this for a very long time for like a good couple of years, essentially, which is, you know, is quite involved. Um, or they'll be on orals for like quite a long time. So, like, that's why they want to do IMs every 28 days. Additionally, you need to make sure they have like yearly vaccines, regular follow-up, plus or minus like surgical involvement if they've got valvulus. Um, infective endocarditis, I'm just checking the slide. Yeah, okay. Um, so pathophysiology of infective endocarditis, you've got damage to the valve, which allows platelets to stick and form a thrombus, which is aseptic, it's an aseptic thrombus, um, but then bacteria can stick to it. Um, and then that's when you get the infective endocarditis. These are the valves that are more likely to be triggered, mitral, aortic, tricuspid, and then pulmonary. Those are the ones that are more likely to be um, impacted in that order. Etiology, staph aureus, is more likely to attack healthy valves and damaged valves, while vir viridens streptococcus 
will only attack damaged valves, mainly the mitral. So this is important if you have a kid that's had repeated um, rheumatic fever, the mitral valve will be unhealthy. So this it is also possible to have this bacteria involved. Also, Staph aureus is yeah, likely as well, but consider that bacteria as well if they ask you a micro question. Um, risk factors, rheumatic fever, like chronic rheumatic heart disease, previous infection, any congenital heart disease. We've just gone over all those congenital heart diseases will, if you've got anything that impacts the valves or creates damage that can lead to a thrombus forming, it can increase your risk of infected endocarditis. And then likewise, if you've had congenital heart defects and you've had a surgical repair um, or prosthetic valves put in, that again increases your risk of infected endocarditis. Um, any, and then any introduction of bacteria. So if you've, this is kind of more so if you've got any of these other risk factors. So if you have poor dental hygiene or dental procedures, any other surgeries that is likely to translocate bacteria or any other sources of infection like UTIs or um, pneumonia. So if you've got a really bad history of the, any of these risk factors and then you get unwell, that bacteria is likely to translocate and cause infective endocarditis. So if someone comes in with a UTI that has a history of, you know, um, rheumatic fever, you have to also consider will this progress to infective endocarditis. Um, presentation, most of them will have a fever. Um, most of them will also have a new memo or a change to a pre-existing memo. That's very classical of infective endocarditis. And then your extra um, extra cardiac symptoms. So you will have like the embolic findings, like your splinter hemorrhages and your Janeway lesions, very rare. But also don't forget about your glomerulonephritis. The thing, the little emboli that can get stuck in like um, your fingers and your um, hands can also get stuck in your kidneys and cause hematuria. Clinically, it's like a it's a judgment based on it's a diagnosis based on clinical judgment. A fever without focus plus a new murmur plus risk factors, very indicative of infective endocarditis in a, you know, a child or an adolescent. There is a criteria, it's all in like the notes kind of about like how many major and how many minor, but it's very like, yeah, it's really more of a clinical judgment. Investigations, blood cultures, two sets, two to three sets of need to be taken from different sites. Um, if clinically unwell, this needs to be done within the first hour of presentation. Um, FB, CRP, VBG, um, and a urinalysis because you're worried about your blur, um, you know, hematuria. ECHO is gold standard as well for your vegetations and regurg. Um, you can see your rheumatoid factor being done, but it's not like um, largely done. Um, clinically unwell patients, Doctors A, B, C, D, do your IV fluids and um, cannulas. And then you start empirical antibiotic treatment, which is three antis, bedpan, flu clocks, and gentamicin. Um, and then once they're clinically stable out of hospital, they will be transferred to a long course of antibiotics. The IG team will determine what this needs to be. What is stable? They're responding to inpatient therapy. It's been afebrile for about three days. Uh, no signs of heart failure and a small vegetation. These are some buzzwords. That's everything. So these are some buzzwords. I'm not sure how relevant this is. I heard that Rupert Hines isn't writing your um, exam this year. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, this is a good summary. Uh, yeah, take it. Take this with a grain of salt. This is from last year. Um, and good luck. Um, I know you're all really great. This is, you know, it's a nice topic. Um, yeah. These are some resources, M Ambos, M Ambros and um, Osmosis are tend to be my my go-tos. Um and yeah, all right, that's me done. Um did we have any questions that I've missed in the chat or did um, anyone want to so I've been answering them as we've been going, but I had a couple of people ask about why um you try to keep the PDA patent in um coarctation of the aorta. And I think I explained it, but like maybe if you wanted to just talk yeah. about it. Where is coarctation? Um, um, yes. So you want to keep it open because um, it's a very small narrowing narrowing in the aorta. So you're getting no blood flow. So they want to keep it open because in coarct, you also likely have, where is, 
Um, yeah, that is a good question, actually. Why do you want to keep it? Yeah. Um, because they don't have a VSD. I was afraid I was going to get off this one. Um, no, I was just sort of, I, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was just sort of saying that um, keeping the PDA open allows for more shunting of blood through the PDA so that it's not just the collaterals from the aorta that are supplying the um, lower limbs. Is that sort of why we do it? Um, well, the the, the um, collaterals up here wouldn't like backflow. Like that's, they're not really supplying the lower limbs. I think... The reason they do it is because I guess, well, it's deoxygenated blood. Actually, you know what? I'll be honest. I don't actually know. Um, yeah, because it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you want to keep a PDA open if it's deoxygenated and, you know, genated blood? My only thing is that if it's closed, there's absolutely no blood going to the limbs and then it's ischemic. But then if it's already deoxygenated, what good is it doing anyway? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know. Oh, no, I I'm sure we're probably not going to get a question like that. No, no. Um, but cool. Thank you so much for for all that, Maddie. Like your slides were great. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody had any final questions for Maddie, or can we let her get back to her weekend? Cool. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks. Um. Our next presenter is Louise, and she's going to take us through ENT. Louise won the um, PEDS prize last year, and she absolutely hates PEDS. So, you know, that means that she's probably she's probably a really good person to take advice from, because if she can win the PEDS prize, then anyone can. No, I'm joking. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, Louise is next. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, can everyone hear me and see my slides? Yes? Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm doing rest ENT and Opthal a lot to get through but it's pretty high yield so here we go um so this is just my little contents so um resp ent and opthal so there's like quite a few r1s for rest so i'll go through all of those um obstructive sleep apnea and allergic rhinitis i've moved them into my ent portion because i don't understand why they're in rest um, I'm not going through TB because I'm sure you guys are all over that from 3B. I'm also not going to go through conjunctivitis and sinusitis because I think that'll be well covered in your GP lectures. Um, so just doing tonsillitis and otitis media because they're very peedsy. Cervical adenitis, look, I'm not going to go over that because I feel like it's very low yield. And then Oxal, you've only got R2 and R3 because it's more GP land. But these ones that I'm going to go through kind of briefly um, are very much for peats. All right, here we go. So we'll go through Stridor first as kind of like your presentation. So first is croup. So this is the infective inflammation of the larynx, trachea and bronchi. So um, the etiology is para-influenza virus. So that's what you need to know. This is causes 70%. Um, obviously, other viruses can cause croup, but in your exams, you're going to say para-influenza virus. Um, in terms of your risk factors, smoke exposure is a big one to kind of get out of, say, an OSCE. Intubation as well. So we're thinking our premies because they've got already like a narrowing of their airway. So if you then put kind of like narrowing through infection on that, it's going to create even more narrowing similar with neuromuscular disease as well because you've got the narrowing from um, collapse of muscles and then less than six months of age it's rare to have croup but it's more severe so be wary and then in the winter months you've got all sorts of viruses going around so a bit of a clue there as well as sick, sick contacts so in terms of your epi it's between the ages of six months and six years if it's less than they're less than six months, it's probably unlikely to be croup. Start thinking of something else. And similarly, if they're older than six years, start thinking of something else. In terms of the pathophysiology, it's pretty like simple. So it's just inflammation of these areas of the airway. And then with inflammation, you get edema and increased secretions to try and get rid of whatever's in there. And that leads to airway narrowing. So in terms of the symptoms, it's very classical for croup. So you've got that viral prodrome for two to three days. And then this kind of goes on to your characteristic barking or seal-like cough. So it's always really good to ask, what does the cough sound like when you're in an OSCE? Because they will say it's barking or seal-like and you can go, there we go, it's croup. And then you can get on with it. 
Um, they'll also have an inspiratory stridor and that's worse at night. They'll have some increased work of breathing and they may or may not have a fever. And then they this will progress onto a persistent cough. So um, kids always have a cough because a lot of um, viruses and stuff just have this persistent ongoing cough. So it's a bit of a theme. In terms of investigations, you're not doing any and you're trying not to really examine the child that much. You're really getting kind of the picture off the history um, from their caregiver um, because examining them can actually worsen the airway um, narrowing. So you just want to like let them be comfortable. So this is just to kind of show you the difference between an infant airway and an adult airway. So as you can see, an infant airway is half the size of an adult. So if you then put some inflammation onto that, it's extremely narrow compared to an adult's airway. Okay, so this is straight from the RCH, um, which is, we, we love the RCH. It's obviously the Bible for um, peds. Um, and this is where I'm getting all my information from. Um, so this is, you've got to kind of look at the croup in terms of mild, moderate or severe. And this is going to dictate how you're going to manage the child. Um, so it's really important that we're, like I said before, it's all about minimal handling. So you're not actually going to measure, measure saturations on a child that's appearing to have mild to moderate croup. It's only severe that you're going to measure the oxygen saturations. Um, so contrasting my mild croup is just going to be they're a well child, but they've kind of got this stridor when they're moving about and active. Um, whereas when you're looking at severe, they've got this persist persistent stridor. And it's really important that you don't use stridor as your measure, though, of severity, because if they have like a very quiet stridor, that could actually mean that they've got extreme airway narrowing rather than like a harsh stridor. Um, and then hypoxia being a very late sign, which is scary. So in terms of management, everyone, and this is kind of goes along with a lot of the conditions I'm going to talk about, everyone gets kind of your supportive care. So like your rest, paracetamol and hydration. Um, and then with airway things, you really want to go by, and I've said it already so many times, minimal handling, and then having them with their care are just so that they're really comfortable and they can assume a position. It's very important with airway disease that they can assume a position that's comfortable for them because the body kind of goes into a state of trying to open up the airway. So just like, don't touch them. <clears throat> In terms of mild to moderate, we're giving them PRED or DEXA, so steroid of your choice. Um, and that's the management there. And then if it's severe, it's you're going to have to admit them. Then you'll be measuring their um, O2 sats and giving them some oxygen if they're saturating below 90% and you want to keep the saturations at 90 or above. And then that's when we chuck on the nebulized adrenaline and they'll also get some steroids as well. So a bit of a double hit there. And then for croup, it's kind of you, it's good to remember when you're going to discharge the child because it's good to um, relay this to their caregiver. So stride off free at rest and then four hours post adrenaline if they're given nebulized adrenaline or 30 minutes post steroids. This comes with a bit of an asterisk. Um, so if they present overnight or um, they live really far from the hospital or this is the second time they've presented with this illness, um, then they might have a longer period of observation, but that's going to be up to more seniors, so don't stress. Um, and then your safety net always, and if they have a recurrence of stridor or at rest, despite having given steroids, then it's always good to come back and get it checked out again. Okay. So moving on to bacterial tracheitis or toxic croup. So this is pretty much just a bacterial super infection. Um, and for your exams, that is staph aureus. Um, it's more common in the, so as I said before, croup is six months to six years. This kind of complication is more in the younger age bracket, so less than two years. And it's pretty much just like fulminant um, croup. So rapidly progressive, um, diffuse kind of airway narrowing and thick secretions. So be wary of the mucus plug um, and then acute airway obstruction. Again, scary. So in terms of the clinical presentation, these are going to be unwell children. So whereas like croup, it can be, they can be quite unwell if it's severe, Ooh, sorry, um, or um, they can be well. So these, these children will be unwell. They'll have a high fever, they'll have a harsh stridor and a productive cough from this, these really thick secretions, and they'll be in respiratory dis 
distress. And a bit of a clue as well is that they may have come in, you think, oh, this is just like viral croup, um, severe, you give them some nebulized adrenaline, but they're not responding. This is when you're thinking, oh, this could be um, bacterial. So in terms of investigations, we want to then get some cultures. Um, you won't do a like a, a neck x-ray, but if you do, there'll be the steeple sign. So this is buzzwordy. I'll show you a little pic. And then you can do um, a bronchoscopy and so you can aspirate some of the um, thick secretions so you can culture that. And then in terms of management, um, you want to make sure the airway is secure because we're doing doctors A, B, C and airways first. And then because this is bacterial, we want to give them some antibiotics in the form of IV kef. So this is your steeple sign. I hope you can see my cursor. So you can just see it looks like a, it's a terrible picture. I apologize, but this is the steeple. Um, and you can just see that this is obviously supposed to be patent. And then you've got all of this edema around. All right, so some differential diagnoses for stridor. Again, these things you, you, you have to know, but they're not on your matrix, so fun. So epiglottitis is quite rare because we now vac vaccinate against Hib or Haemophilus influenza B. So um, Hib is, you require a T cell response to mount a response against Hib. And unfortunately, until two years of age, you have a really terrible T cell response. So in younger um, children, it's more common and those that are unvaccinated, but you get your vaccinated vaccination at two, four, six and 18 months, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it's good to kind of have a brief understanding of like the vaccination schedule just so you can be like, oh, are they fully vaccinated or not? Um, and then it's your triad or the Ds. So drooling, dysphagia and distress because you've got such airway narrowing that the secretions can't get down. So you have drooling and then you've got closing off of the esophagus from the edema. So then you get dysphagia. And then obviously if you have a tight airway, that is terribly distressing. Um, they'll have high fevers and that translates to rigors as well. Um, the muffled voice, uh, they'll have stridor work of breathing and then um, tripoding and neck hyperextension. So they're assuming the sniffing position to try and get increased air down. Um, and then again, you want the management is airway management. And then when they do the laryngoscopy, you'll see the characteristic, again, buzzword, cherry red epiglottis. Um, and then we'll give IV kef and DEXA. And then this is reportable to the um, Department of Health and Human Services. And then again, I have a picture of if you were to do a x-ray, again, it's the characteristic thumbprint sign, which I'll show you as well. Okay. And then in terms of inhaled foreign body, so this again is quite a characteristic story of sudden onset of cough, shortness of breath, choking, stride or wheeze, depending on how far the foreign body has gotten down. It's usually in a child who's left unattended, so always good to ask that. And it's going to be in your younger age group because they're more likely to shove things down their throat. Um, in terms of where it's going to go, it's usually into the right main bronchus because we know that's um, larger than the left. Um, and so on exam, you might hear some unilateral, you might see, sorry, some unilateral reduced chest expansion, focal wheeze if it's a little bit lower down and decreased breath sounds. In terms of the acute management, if they're coughing, they're trying to obviously get it up. So then you can encourage them to try and cough it up. And that's great. If they have an ineffective cough and they're unresponsive, then you're going in down the road of life support. Um, but if they're conscious, then you can do your five back blows and your five thrusts. And if they're less than one year, you're doing this via the chest. And if they're greater than one year, you can do it by the abdomen. And if this is not working, you can do yeah a chest X-ray to see where it is and a bronchoscopy to get rid of the foreign object. So this is your thumbprint sign. So usually the epiglottis, so this is for epiglottitis. So usually the epiglottis is just like a little kind of like one kind of streak there, I guess. But now it's all oedematous. So it looks like a big thumbprint. All right. And then these ones are a little bit kind of like off the beaten path, but laryngomalacia and subglottic stenosis have seen them come up before, but you just need to know a few things about them. So laryngomalacia is a congenital condition of the larynx and it's the most common. So it's the characteristic floppy omega shaped, again, buzzword, um, of the epiglottis. And then so you get this supraglottic co collapse with inspiration 
and this translates to a low-pitched inspiratory stridor. And this is worse when they're supine sleeping and feeding and better when they're prone, so kind of more intermittent. And it is associated with um, reflux as well. Um, and then you do a laryngoscopy and you see the omega-shaped epiglottis, but it is self-limiting, so it's really just kind of under development of these structures. So as the child grows, they grow out of this stridor and it's, it's very much benign. In terms of subglottic stenosis, it can be congenital or acquired. So congenital is just there hasn't been complete canalization of the cricoid region, whereas um, the acquired is from intubation, so premies, and then you get scarring of the region. And so because it's a fixed um, like scar, or um, you get a biphasic, so an inspiratory and expiratory stridor. And again, for the congenital, it's self-limiting. So as they grow and that region develops, then they no longer have the stridor. But I think with the scarring, there is um, the management is more so like ablation. But again, you don't need to know that. It's more just there might be like a question with a vignette and you just need to know the diagnosis. All right, so moving on to some wheeze. So bronchiolitis, so this is a viral lower respiratory tract infection. Um, the etiology is RSV. Again, other viruses can cause this, but for your exams, is that well, this is the most common and this is what you're going to say is the answer. In terms of the risk factors, um, it's very similar to croup, smoke exposure, winter months, premies, they've got small airways and whatnot, um, and then sick contacts. In terms of the epi, it's very important for bronchiolitis. It's um, very common in the less than 12 months. So if you have a child with a wheeze and they're less than 12 months, you're thinking bronchiolitis. If it, they're greater than 12 months, then you're going to go down more the path of is this viral-induced wheeze, asthma syndrome realm, which we'll go through. In terms of the clinical presentation, again, similar to croup in that it starts with like this viral prodrome and then it moves on to um, tachypnea and increased work of breathing. Um, this also is with poor feeding as well because they're kind of navigating, do I breathe or do I um, feed? They'll have a fever, widespread expiratory wheeze, um, bibasal fine and inspiratory crepitations, and then a cough. In terms of investigations, again, it's clinical, kind of similar to croup as well, like you want a minimal handling as well, um, and it's viral, so there's not really investigations that you're going to do. Again, it's all on the history and examination. Again, from the RCH, we've got mild, moderate, and severe. Um, so this is basically um, based off their behaviour, so are they normal or are they really kind of lethargic, fatigued, and irritable? Um, oxygen saturations, um, and then their work of breathing. Cool. And then also their hydration status. I think with all children, it's really good to um, get an idea of their hydration status. Management. So um, big note, they have a wheeze. So sometimes you want to jump to using a bronchodilator because you think, let's open up the airway. But because they're so young, they don't have smooth muscle development. So like a bronchodilator is going to do nothing and it's just going to subject them to treatment that they don't need. That's more handling, which we don't want to do. So then mild, again, we're going to our supportive therapy. So small, frequent feeds, minimal handling. You can also give them, you know, some paracetamol to bring down any fever, et cetera, et cetera. Moderate, we're going to admit them because they need some NG hydration. So with peds, you know, how we go oral hydration, then NG feeds, and then IV. And then if they're deoxygenating, you're going to support their oxygen. And then severe, same thing, admit, hydrate, and then they might need some extra help with their oxygenation in the form of high flow nasal prongs or cannulae. And then, yeah, then there's the controversial um, palivizumab, um, which is an anti-RSV IgG. But you're only really going to give this to really high risk of vulnerable groups and it's never going to be the answer in your exam and it's never going to be the answer in your OSCE. So that's just there in case that you come across it um, 
Cool. And then counselling. So um, it's a viral illness and all um, caregivers just want antibiotics or like something to be done. But if you say, oh, it's supportive management, they're not really happy. So you've got to like kind of go through the whole thing of like it's acute illness that goes for two weeks, but we'll support them through it, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, like I said before, all of these things end with this cough that just keeps going forever. So they might have this cough that just keeps going and a wheeze, but that's just normal and they'll eventually get rid of it. Cool. All right. So asthma, I'm just going to go through what you need to know for peds because I'm sure you're all over um, like asthma from last year. So this is just ped specific information. Okay, cool. So a wheeze in a less than 12 month old is not asthma, it's bronchiolitis. And we just went through that. So ACE. Um, then you've got to think now when they're older than 12 months, like, is it a viral induced wheeze? Is it asthma? So wheeze in children is super common, but not always is asthma. So um, in terms of diagnosing asthma, I was surprised by this. I thought we had to do spirometry to diagnose asthma, um, but you don't. So it's a clinical diagnosis. And I think that's really important. So it's all based off the history. So they need to have the, the classical signs of asthma. So wheeze, um, work of breathing, chest tightness, and a cough, so a dry cough, and this is all during the asthma attack. And then they'll have any of the following, so a recurrence. So we know that asthma is a recurrent obstructive airway disease, um, and then it can be dineural, so is it worse in the morning, worse at night? Is there a known trigger? Yes, I get it with exercise. Yes, I get it with cold weather. I get it when I go to my grandma's house because she has a cat. Um, do they have atopy? So do they also have allergic rhinitis and eczema? or a family history of this? And then do they respond to a SAVA? So when they're having these attacks, if you give them a bronchodilator, does this make their symptoms better? If they're greater than six years and you're uncertain of the diagnosis, like it's not a very convincing history, but you're kind of like, nah, then you can do spirometry and noting that they need to be older than six years because younger than this, their they're, they're airways aren't developed enough to conduct spirometry. So then there's viral induced wheeze. So um, preschoolers, so one to five years, it's very common for them to have viral induced wheeze and only 50% will go on to develop asthma. And only a portion of viral induced wheeze is actually responsive to a SABA. But that response to a SABA is not then diagnostic of asthma. Um, they've got to have it all kind of going on here with the clinical diagnosis. And then oral steroids are not indicated for a viral induced wheeze. You just help them along with a SABA, maybe. Okay, so a bit more on asthma. So um, for peds, we like to break it up into these different um, patterns. So the infrequent intermittent being our most common and then our frequent intermittent and persistent. And then it's based on, do they have interval symptoms? No, no, yes. Do the frequency of their flares and then do they need a preventer? So if it's persistent, then yes, they need a preventer. But if it's kind of these um, intermittent um, variants, then it kind of depends on the severity and the frequency of their flares. But I'll just leave that there for you guys to kind of go through. It's not super important, but good to know. Um, and then in, in the terms of having an acute asthma, oh no, sorry, backtrack. This is in terms of their control. So when you're seeing them kind of as an outpatient, do they have good control, partial control or poor control? Don't worry about partial control. Just is it good or is it bad? And that's just going to say like, do I need to step up the thing? And they'll make it so obvious. It'll be like, no, I, I very rarely get anything. And I just sometimes have to use my Saba, whatever, good control. Or is it poor control? No, like I'm getting all these nocturnal symptoms. I'm using my puffer like three times a day, yada, yada, yada. And you're like, I've got to step up the approach, which we'll go through. And then in terms of, this is what I was jumping ahead to. So if they're having an asthma attack, then you want to figure out, is it mild, moderate, severe, or life-threatening? So mild just being like, they've got the asthma symptoms, like some chest tightness, um, shortness of breath, but they've just, all they've got really is some mild increased work of breathing all the way through to life-threatening where they're not speaking because they can't breathe, they're cyanotic, their work of breathing is through the roof. And again, they'll make it very obvious if they're on this side of the spectrum or this side of the spectrum and if you're like super worried or not super worried. So management in the acute setting, sorry. <clears throat> management in the acute setting, so mild, moderate or severe. 
Um, so uh, a bit different here than adults. So for the mild, you're going to give them salbutamol. So salbutamol is a Saba. It's also called Ventolin. Um, and you give burst therapy. And I'll, this is what burst therapy is. And you give it via a metered dose inhaler with a spacer. Spacer is really important. So it's really easy to remember this, which is nice. So it's um, if they're less than six years of age, you give six puffs. And then you reassess after 20 minutes. If it's mild, then that's probably going to knock it on the head. And that's great. If not, you can just repeat it. Um, and then if they're more than six years, then you just double it. And it's 12 puffs and then you reassess after 20 minutes. Great. And then we move on. If it's moderate, you're going to do the same thing. So um, you're going to give them a Saba six or 12 puffs. And then you'll repeat it um, every 20 minutes for one hour. And you also give them ipratropium or a Sama or called Atrovent, and you give them, again, burst therapy. But the burst therapy for a Sama is four puffs if you're less than six years every 20 minutes for one hour. And then for over six years, again, you double it, eight puffs every 20 minutes for one hour. So that's nice and easy to remember. And then with the moderate, they may have some um, low sat so you can support them along with some oxygen, which is nice. If it's severe... You're doing everything we just said, Saba, Sama, but you're also going to give them some steroids. If this is not helping, it's good to know for your exams, your second and your third line therapy. So your second line therapy is your IV, amino filings, and or magnesium sulfate. And these are both just bronchodilators. And same with your IV salbutamol. Um, yeah. And then in terms of once they've, you've gotten them through the acute asthma management, everyone's good. It's very important to go through discharge planning. You want to update their action, their asthma action plan. You want to go through inhaler technique because it's always poor and make sure they have GP follow-up. Very important. Okay. And then in terms of chronic management, it's a little bit different for the different age groups. So if they're less than five years, so this is preschooler, um, you start with the Saba, always do, and then you add on your um, low dose ICS, and this is your preventer. And then the next one is actually adding on Montelukast or a leukotriene antagonist, or you can increase your ICS. I mean, this is because for children less than five years, you can't give a LABA. There's no safety data on it is the reason why. And then if they're six to 11 years old, you do the same thing as um, a less than five-year-old, but you can add a LABA as your um, as an alternative to say your Monty Lucas or add it on when you step up again. And then beyond 11 years, it's just your normal adult management, which you would have learned last year. So I just haven't gone through it today, but there we go. So cystic fibrosis, um, big, big condition. Um, so the etiology is um, it's an autosomal recessive mutation. I would remember that. Hint, hint. Um, and uh, it's of the CF transmembrane conduct conductance regulatory gene on chromosome seven. Um, and there's a bucket load of mutations, but in Australia, the most common is the Delta F508. Cool. Um, in terms of the um, epigenetics, one in 25 are carriers. And that's why we do the Guthrie heel prick test in neonates, because it is quite common in terms of one of these um, hereditary diseases. In terms of the patho, so this is just good to know how it kind of affects the different organs in the body. And sometimes you can get like a counselling station on this. And obviously you're not going to go through like the in-depth patho to um, the caregivers, but it's good to have an idea of it. So it's systemic epithelial chloride channel dysfunction. So what this translates to is you don't have chloride kind of on the membrane. And so... Um, sodium then follows the chloride and then water follows the sodium into the cell so you have a dry membrane that dry membrane then like kills off all the cilia because it's not um like floating in fluid and then mucus hypersecretion to kind of counteract this dry membrane and so then you have the stasis of mucus because you've got no cilia to flush it away so stasis is the base basis for recurrent infection and then recurrent infection plus mucus sitting there and plugging up ducts leads to organ damage. Cool. So in terms of the presentation, it's good to look at it, what happens as an infant, what happens as a child, and then what happens as an adolescent. 
Um, and you just need to know kind of like a little few things about it in case it pops up on the exam slash counselling. So in infancy, you have, um, you can get a meconium ileus. So that will be one of your presentations for bilious vomiting. And you'll probably have a GI lecture. So I won't go into more on that. Neonatal jaundice, you'll probably also have a lecture on that. So um, that's just from biliary obstruction, failure to thrive, failure to thrive um, because of the increased demands, pancreatic insufficiency, recurrent infections, pancreatic insufficiency. So that's your steatorrhea and your failure to thrive and then recurrent infections. In childhood, developmental delay, just because you've got all of this stuff going on. Um, bronchiectasis, uh, which you would have learned about last year, but it's your productive cough, wheeze, bilateral course crepitations, and one of the conditions that causes clubbing. They can get rectal prolapse just because they're kind of chronically constipated. Um, sinusitis and nasal polyps, and then distal intestinal obstructive syndrome. It's just from the recurrent constipation causing recurrent bowel obstruction, sadly. And then in adolescence, so they can get allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Um, and this is just because they can get the weird and wonderful bugs. They always, and then these weird and, wonder, weird and wonderful bugs can then cause a, like hypersensitivity in the lungs. And that's the allergic component. They can get diabetes because by this point, the pancreas is just getting exhausted. Um, then they can develop cirrhosis and gallstones because by this point, the plugging in the biliary system can lead to cirrhosis. Pneumothorax because now their bronchiectasis is really bad. And unfortunately, um, sterility as well. Bilateral absence of the vas. Okay. In terms of management, it's huge. Um, so I'm not going to go through it all today just because it's like a lot. But um, in terms of investigations, as I mentioned, you do the newborn screening. So this is the GER3 heel prick test, which is an immunoreactive of the plasma tri trypsinogen. Um, good to know, it's been a question before. The then confirmatory test, so that's your screening test. Um, your confirmatory test or your gold standard test is the um, sodium chloride sweat test. Um, and then some extras you can do, you can do some DNA testing to see if they have any mutations that are sensitive to more directive, directed therapy for CF. Um, and then um, there's prenatal carrier testing, which you'll learn about in your women's lectures as well. In terms of management, I think what you really need to say if it's an OSCE is multidisciplinary care team approach, because there's going to be a specialist for each area of the body that's affected. But because this is a RESP lecture, I just thought I'd say what would do for RESP. So for RESP, there's things like prophylactic antibiotics, um, vaccinations to prevent the infections in the first place, bronchodilators because it's an obstructive airway disease, chest physio to try and get all that mucus up and increase lung expansion, mucolytics, again, to get rid of the mucus, and then where, you know, the end kind of thing is unfortunately transplant. All right. So we'll go on to cough. So um, pneumonia, again, what's new? Because you would have learnt about pneumonia at extent last year. So in terms of PEDS, pneumonia, again, is a clinical di diagnosis with fever, cough, and tachypnea, and no wheeze, the absence of wheeze. Um, so the etiology is usually in children polymicrobial, so viral and bacterial. And it's good to um, know kind of the presentation of atypical pneumonia, um, which is most likely from mycoplasma. So it's usually in more than, um, more than, greater than five years of age. Um, and they'll have these widespread shifting crackles. So like they don't have just one area of consolidation, which you hear, it kind of moves about. And then if you were to x-ray them, they'd have patchy infiltrates and they usually don't have tachypnea, which is interesting. And they might actually have like vomiting and diarrhea instead. So it's kind of, again, atypical. In terms of clinical presentation, so like I said, to diagnose pneumonia, they'll have fever, cough and, cough and tachypnea, but they'll also have increased work of breathing. They might be apneic and then have obviously the crackles and the bronchial breathing on auscultation, which will say, oh, this is a right lower lobe pneumonia or whatever. Um, in terms of um, investigations, it's clinical only if it's severe or they're being admitted for it. 
because it's severe or it's you're thinking complicated like they've got an effusion and abscess or something are you going to then you do a chest x-ray otherwise it's clinical um, and then there is complications as mentioned are uh, effusions empyema abscess or it becomes a necrotizing um, infection in terms of management, mild, moderate, or severe. So if it's mild, you just give them some oral amoxicillin and then you ask them to return or see their GP in 24 to 48 hours for review to make sure that their symptoms are improving. If it's moderate, you're going to admit them. You're probably going to need to give them some oxygen again if they're desaturating um, hydration. And then again, you can give them oral amoxicillin as well um, or IV Ben pen. Either it doesn't matter, they both have the same efficacy. Um, it kind of just depends, I guess, if they're tolerating orals or not. And then severe, you're um, giving them IV kef and flu clocks. Cool. Uh, whooping cough, again, it's not on your matrix, but you need to know it. Um, so the etiology is Bordadella pertussis. Um, the risk factors being um, being unvaccinated from pertussis, sick contact, it's very infectious, and being less than six months because the disease um, is really, really bad in these vulnerable little babies. In terms of the clinical presentation, it's broken up into like these three stages. So you have the prodromal stage, which is cough and coryza, and this lasts for about a week. And then it moves on to your characteristic um, spasmodic cough, and this is worse at night and with feeding. And then you get the inspiratory, inspiratory hoop sound, which I'm not going to do for you, but they get this. And then during these attacks, they get like a red face because um, this is from increased pressure. So they get red faces, they can get vomiting, become apneic, and they get quite exhausted from this. And then if it's kind of really bad, then that increased pressure can lead to nosebleeds, some subconjunctal hemorrhages, facial petechiae, and then from all of the exhaustion and stuff, failure to thrive. And then um, the third phase is this characteristic 100-day cough. So this ongoing cough. Um, and like I said, every kind of infection, respiratory infection in children has this ongoing cough. And that's why kids are always coughing. In terms of investigation, surprise, surprise, it's clinical, um, minimal handling, and you'd only really swab them um, to find out if it for sure is Bordadella pertussis if you weren't sure or if it's required for like infection control purposes. In terms of management, if they're less than six months, you're going to admit them, and that's because the disease is really bad for um, these little babies. Um like I said, it's also very infectious. So um, you need to discuss isolation. So if you're going to give them antibiotics, um, they need to be on antibiotics for five days before they can go out and not be isolated or wait until they've had the cough for greater than 21 days because they're infectious just prior to the cough starting and then for 21 days of the cough. Um, it's a reportable um, to the Department of Health and Human Services. And then the antibiotic of choice is clarithromycin or azithromycin. Um, and it's given in, if they're in the cater this first phase, the prodromal phase, or early in the paroxysmal phase. And this is just to reduce the severity and spread. If it's later than that, then they're not kind of infectious anymore. So you're not going to be doing anything for the spread and it's not going to really reduce any severity because they've kind of come out of the worst of it. So you're not going to give them antibiotics. Um, and then other indications for the, sorry for antibiotics would be if you admitted them or they had some kind of complication from the whooping cough. Um, and then you'll vaccinate if they're not vaccinated as well as vaccinating people around if they're not vaccinated. And then you can consider prophylactic antibiotics um, depending on the stage of the illness um, and uh, who's sick contacts, really trying to protect those that are less than six months. And the prophylactic antibiotic of choice is the same as the treatment, so clarithromycin or azithromycin. All right, so we're moving on now to ENT. So that was RESP. Um, cool. So, oh, well, this is technically rest, but I put it in ENT because I thought it fit better here. <laughs> so allergic rhinitis, I'm sure you guys all know what this is. Um, so etiology, so it's either if it's seasonal, we call it hay fever, or if it's perennial, it's just allergic rhinitis. Um, and then perennial will be like your mites or your dander or whatever it is. Um, epi, so 80% of asthmatics will have allergic rhinitis. 
And then for those who have allergic rhinitis, 30% will have asthma. And it's called the that's why it's called the United Airway Disease, because it's the exact same pathophysiology happening in the lungs as what's happening in the no, like the nasal mucosa. And that is an IgE mediated type one hypersensitivity reaction. In terms of the clinical presentation, so you have bilateral warty, water, watery rhinorrhea, um, sneezing, congestion, itch, itch is like um, allergy, um, altered sense of smell just from all of the congestion, conjunctivitis, sinusitis and dermatitis all kind of come in with this as well. Um, and then again, it's a clinical diagnosis. Um, and then in terms of the management, it's a, a bit of a step up approach similar to um, like asthma. So you start off with oral or intranasal antihistamines. And then if that's not working, then you can add on some corticosteroids intranasally. And then it depends on what's the predominant feature. So after that, so if their predominant feature is rhinorrhea, then you can try an intranasal SAMA. If their predominant symptom is conjunctivitis, then you'll use antihistamine eye drops. And then if they've got concurrent asthma, then Montelukast is really good at kind of combating um, the asthma and allergic rhinitis components. So that's um, allergic rhinitis, pretty straightforward. Um, Obstructive sleep apnea, so cessation of breathing due to sudden obstruction of the airway during sleep. Um, the etiology, um, adenoid hypertrophy is the most common um, and will be kind of what you will find on your exams, whatever. Um, and then some other things are uh, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, so they have an enlarged tongue, tongue and lingual tonsils, um, cerebral palsy as well, and obesity. Um, in terms of the epi, it's most common between two and seven years of age because this is when there's peak um, lymphoid hyperplasia. And then in terms of the patho, it's just they're getting poor uh, poor quality sleep and less sleep. And then this kind of translates to impaired memory, energy, um, recovery, and then it really messes around with your hormones. And so um, your leptin and your ghrelin's all over the place so it can promote obesity and insulin resistance, unfortunately. In terms of clinical presentation, snoring, um, and then uh, caregivers might say they've obscene um, cessation of breathing during sleep. Um, you might see that they're mouth breathing in a consultation and then they might describe poor attention and school performance, failure to thrive because they've got this chronic increased work of breathing, which is very um, energy demanding. And then during the night, they might also have um, enuresis and sweating. In terms of investigations, um, there's the OSA-5, and this is really good at ruling out um, obstructive sleep apnea. Um, you can do an all overnight pul pulse oximetry if you don't want to move to a sleep study because that is quite invasive. Um, but if this the pulse ox is like negative, then they still need to have a sleep study. So we generally just jump to the sleep study. Um, and then in terms of management, it's really treat the cause. So for most children, it'll be that they've got big adenoids. So you refer them on to ENT and they chop them out. Um, in the interim, you can give them some intranasal steroids just to help kind of reduce any inflammation that's there. There is a bit of a role for CPAP, but it's not as big a role as it is in adults. Loss of weight's always good if the um, cause is obesity related. And then um, some of the kind of congenital um, syndromes that have kind of craniofacial abnormalities, then they can get surgery for that. Um, and if they've got asthma, it's really good to optimize that because, again, it's kind of all similar with the inflammation and whatnot. Oh, and this is adenoid facies, so very stereotypical with the like receding chin and the crooked nose, and that's actually because of always they can get like um, – Either they have concurrent uh, allergic rhinitis or um, they've just from that kind of the inflammation and stuff that happens, they are always like wiping their nose up. So they get a crooked nose and like this little, I think it's called the allergic salute or something like that. And then tired eyes because they're getting really poor sleep as well. And then they they get this receding chin and narrow face just because they're mouth breathing and because they're so young, it changes like the structure of their face. And then unfortunately, if this has happened, they need to get like jaw surgery and stuff, which is sad. Um. Okay, sore throat. Ooh. All right. I will try and power through. So sore throat. So this is tonsillitis or pharyngitis. 
Um, it's also very GP. So in terms of etiology, it's always, always a virus. So this is RSV, rhinovirus, adenovirus, flu or paraflu. Um, and it's not usually gas or strep pyogenes. So in terms of the clinical presentation, it's a sore throat. And then things to point you down, this is viral. They'll have, if it's a cough and coryza, as well as obviously a sore throat, then it's it's going to be viral. Some other things to point you down the viral road will be conjunctivitis, horse throat, some diarrhea, viral rash, and maybe some anterior stomatitis, so kind of like a perioral dermatitis type vibe. If it's bacterial, it'll be more of a sudden onset because it's more of a fulminant kind of disease. They'll have a high fever, some tender lymphadenopathy, and you look in their throat and they've got some gnarly like exudate from their tonsils. In terms of investigations, you'll only do a throat swab if you think it's gas, they're greater than four years of age and they're high risk. Because even if you think it's gas, but they're not in a high risk group, which I'll go through, then there's no point swabbing them because you're still not going to give them antibiotics anyway. So it's really going to do nothing. So in terms of the management, again, it's supportive. So hygiene, analgesia, throat lozenges are always great um, and hydration. And you're only going to give antibiotics being phenoxymethyl penicillin if they're a high risk group. And this is to prevent complications of um, pharyngitis. It's not really to actually treat the pharyngitis because the antibiotics don't do a whole lot. They might reduce the course by like one day and reduce the severity a little bit, but it's really to prevent the complications that like Maddie went through of rheumatic heart disease and the superative um, complications, which I'll, I'll run through. So these, so if they're any of the kind of high risk groups, so um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, Maori or Pacific Islanders, personal or family history of rheumatic heart disease, immunocompromised, or they have a superative complication, which I'll go through. If you've given them their supportive therapy, but they're, they're not really, they've still got a really sore throat, you can give them some steroids to kind of help with the inflammation. And then if they're getting recurrent episodes of tonsillitis, then you can do a tonsillectomy. So the, the complications, um, there's peritonsillar abscess or quinsy, retropharyngeal abscess and scarlet fever. Um, so for quinsy and retropharyngeal abscess, these are deep neck infections. So for quinsy, it's kind of um, like an abscess within the tonsil. And so um, you get uh, uh, painful and difficulty swallowing. So adenophagia is painful swallowing, dysphagia is difficulty swallowing, and then this translates to drooling. They'll get um, trismus as well. So that's um, like they can't really open their mouth as wide because it's so tender. They get the um, like a hot potato voice. Um, they'll also have uvular deviation because now they've got a huge um, like abscess. And then you can refer to ENT to drain the abscess because you always want to get rid of the source and then you'll give them IV Ben Pen. For retropharyngeal abscess, the abscess is lower down. So they'll it's um, like a tender neck kind of mass. Again, they'll have painful difficulty swallowing, but because it's lower down, they'll get um, a stiff neck or um, torticollis. And then you can do a lateral um, neck x-ray as well, just to see kind of the, the size of the abscess. And then you'll be referring to ENT for um, whether they need a drain or whatever. And then you'll give them IV augmentin. And then scarlet fever is just from the gas exotoxins. And then it's more, they're more vulnerable around five to 15 years of age. Um, they'll, what's pointing you towards this is more of a sudden and a really high fever. They'll have this very characteristic blanching sandpaper like rash that then desquamates after three to four days. So peeling off of the rash, gross. They'll also have a strawberry tongue and then, um, like perioral pallor. Um, for scarlet fever, you don't actually have to give them antibiotics. Um, you can if you want, um, but it's only really if it's severe scarlet fever. It's not actually an indication for antibiotics. And this is what the rash looks like and the tongue. Okay, acute otitis media. So um, this is really important to know quite a bit about and it's very GP as well. So in terms of etiology, it's um, viral more than it is bacterial. So adenovirus or enterovirus. Um, and then the bacteria to know is strepneum, H. influenzae and Maroxysa cateralis. Again, the risk factors are similar, smoke exposure, winter, 
um, sick contacts in the form of um, childcare, adenoid, hy adenoid hypertrophy as well, because it's preventing kind of the flow of the fluid. And then Turner syndrome, it's one of the things that can point you towards that. They get recurrent otitis media. In terms of the epi, it's more common between 6 and 18 months, and this is because they have a horizontal eustachian tube, so the drainage is not as good, and it's super-duper common. So 75% of children have one episode before school. In terms of clinical presentation, it's acute ear pain. It's relieved by pulling the pinna. They'll have a fever. They'll be have anorexia, vomiting, and lethargy. It's actually quite a common cause of a febrile seizure because they have can get quite a high fever from it. And then in terms of investigations, you don't do anything except for look in their ear, and this is what you'll see here. So um, loss of light reflex, and that's because they have this opaque tympanic membrane, which is bulging and very red and vascular. Again, a theme, supportive therapy, hydrate, rest, um, give them some analgesia, and then you'll wait and watch for 24 to 48 hours to see if it gets better. Um, you can give oral analgesia or you can actually put it in the ear. So lignocaine drops only if they don't have a perforation. Um, and then in terms of uh, antibiotics, it's oral amoxicillin is the choice of antibiotics. Um, and you'll only give it if they don't improve after 48 hours of supportive therapy. If they're systemically unwell, so this is like very lethargic, pale and irritable, or they're vulnerable, so less than six months or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or immunocompromised, or they have bilateral um, acute otitis media um, and they're young, they have cochlear implants, or this is their only good ear, like they're deaf in the other ear. These are the complications that you can get. So there's otitis media with effusion, chronic otitis media with effusion or glue ear, and then chronic superative otitis media. So these are the, what they all look like when you look in the ear. So if it's an effusion, this is just kind of like an incidental finding type thing. So it's just the persistent effusion that you get with acute otitis media, but there's no infection or inflammation left. It's just the fluid in the ear. Um, so there's no symptoms and you just look in the ER and it just, you can just see the, the fluid, which is gray, white, like a bluey color. It's self-limiting and 90% resolve within three months. However, if this goes on for longer than three months, that fluid in the ear, in the ear becomes quite thick. And then this translates to conductive hearing loss. And then that can lead to kind of um, behavioral issues at school. Um, and so when you look in the ear, you'll kind of see this, you get this tympanic membrane retraction, which you can see here and bubbling in the ear, which you can't see in this picture. And then this is when you would refer them on to for tympanostomy. So these are grommets to drain all the fluid. Um, and this is because it's causing hearing loss. And then for the chronic superative otitis media, this is when you have chronic infection plus a perforation. So you have purulent um, discharge coming out of the ear for greater than six weeks because you have the perforation you have this conductive hearing loss it's painless because if there's a perforation it's painless because um, you don't have that increased pressure anymore um, but there isn't a high risk of intracranial infection and mastoiditis for obvious reasons and then you need a dry oral toilet to keep getting rid of the pus and then you can put some antibiotic drops in and then Last two complications are a perforation. So if there's a perforation, that's actually causes relief of pain and then they'll have um, discharge coming out of the ear. And then mastoiditis is actually the most common um, complication, but it is extremely rare. And you get this post-auricular erythema, um, edema and tenderness. So if you tap on the back of the ear, it's exquisitely painful. And then these guys need some IV antibiotics and ENT. All right. Um, I know I've only got like eight minutes left. Um, ophthalmology is very, very low yield. So I'm literally just going to whiz through these. Um, oh, okay. With the exception of orbital cellulitis, pretty high yield. So, <laughs> um, periorbital cellulitis, um, is actually like pretty benign. It's just, it's just cellulitis around the eye. So um, orbital cellulitis though is a medical emergency. So I've put the things in red, which are um, like your red flags and it's really good to just kind of compare the two. So orbital is where it's not, it's not only preceptal cellulitis, but it's gone behind. So it's deep orbital subcutaneous tissue as well as the extra ocular muscles. And it's usually following like a sinus infection. So 80%. Um, and then there's some other causes here. 
both cause a unilateral red swollen painful eye but the real differentiator is for orbital it's really it's tender to move the eye and they'll also be systemically unwell with a fever and malaise and you're really worried and you really want to ask about headache because this might um, point you towards an intracranial infection any changes to vision so double vision reduced acuity and then an afferent pupillary defect and then um, proptosis as well might point you towards an abscess and then for orbital cellulitis you need to this is a medical emergency so you need to admit them nil by mouth because they may need some kind of procedure ophthal and ENT urgently They'll probably do a contrast CT to just find out if there's any complications. And then because they're systemically unwell, you need to do like septic workup with an FBE in cultures. And they'll need IV broad spectrum antibiotics and then daily ophthal um, review to make sure that their visual acuity is okay. Contrast is the orbital cellulitis. Just think of it as cellulitis around the eye. If it's mild, they've literally just got the cellulitis around the eye. You just give them some oral kef. But if it's moderate in terms, it's really quite painful and it's causing the eye to kind of close over, then you'll give IV in the form of flu clocks or kef. Cool. Um, and then last three conditions, just quickly buzz through them. So retinoblastoma, it's a tumor of the retina. Um, it's a tumor from the retinoblastoma 1 tumor suppressor gene mutation. It kind of can be heritable. So this is most likely autosomal dominant. If it's that, it'll be bilateral and multifocal, meaning they'll have tumors elsewhere in their body because it's a tumor suppressor gene mutation. Um, if it's spontaneous, it'll just be unilateral, like in this picture, poor little guy. In terms of clinical presentation, if it's not just kind of picked up through doing like a... Um, red reflex, they might present with strabismus or a bit of eye pain just from the growing of the tumour. And then the red reflex, which we do in newborn exams, you'll see leukocoria. And then ophthal and oncology can deal with that. You don't need to know the management. Cool. Cataract never comes up. But anyway, um, it's cataract, so a pacification of the lens. Etiology can be hereditary, so autosomal dominant. Um, it can be congenital, so rubella and varicella. Um, and then some other things can cause it too. In terms of clinical presentation, because they're not getting the visual stimulus in their eye, they can get like nystagmus, their eye just like wigs out. Strabismus, which I'll go through on the next slide really quickly. Um, so just like a squint or a lazy eye. Photophobia, because obviously the light causes like the scattering of the light. And then a developmental delay because they're not getting visual cues. Um, and then in terms of complication, they can have visual loss because their brain's not being given um, like visual stimulus. So they just like shut off the eye is how I think of it. Um, so if you see um, like a cataract in a newborn exam, it's again like an ophthal emergency um, because they can be blind for the rest of their life. And then obviously this is what a like a little um, cataract looks like. Uh, and then you can give them correct. So then in terms of the age, if they're really young, it's emergency, give them to ophthal. If they're a bit older, you can like try some corrective lenses like we do in adults. And then obviously cataract surgery. Okay, I'm fairly sure this is my last slide. Sorry, I'm banging on for ages. Ooh, strabismus, so misalignment of the la of the eyes. It's colloquial called squint. Um, so the etiology can be anything that kind of prevents the visual stimulus to the eye. So we just went through retinoblastoma and cataracts, a refractive area, uh, a refractive error, so near or long sightedness, and then premies as well, just because they have like underdeveloped eyes and whatnot. In terms of the patho, you can have upward and downward strabismus, but it's most common to have horizontal, so esotropia or exotropia. So esotropia is inward deviation, exotropia is outward deviation. Esotropia can be accommodative or congenital. Accommodative is most common. It's just an excessive intern when they converge, when they do convergence. It's more common if they've got a refractive area error in the form of hyperopia and 20% develop amblyopia. I'll tell you what amblyopia is in a second. Congenital is like an obvious intern. Um, they don't have a refractive area er, error and they like um, most of them will get amblyopia. And then exotropia is just an intermittent outward turn when they're tired. Um, and so in terms of um, the issue with this is amblyopia. So if the eye is not, is like lazy, then it's again, not getting visual stimulus. So the brain literally is like, 
stuff it and just like closes off that eye and then they can become like blind in that eye and that's what amblyopia is um so what we do is it's really cute you like patch the good eye and so then the bad eye has to like work and actually like catch all of the visual stimulus and stuff and then it can correct the um squint and you can like there's different times you don't have to patch it all the time because then they go to school and they get teased and that's like not fun um and then if they've got hyperopia you can give them corrective lenses they can have cute little glasses and then sometimes if they have like a outward turn that's chronic then the like the eye muscle gets really like strong and so sometimes you have to have surgery to um like lax up the muscle um, and then in terms of exotropia, just because it's intermittent, the, the correction is just cosmetic because like there's actually no amblyopia. It's not doing anything to the child's vision. It just doesn't look very nice. So sometimes you can do corrective surgery for that. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. Sorry that took so long. Um, thanks guys. I, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Yeah. Thanks for that, Louise. Um, so we had a couple of questions. One question was, how do you tell the difference between uh, bronchiolitis and asthma? Um, yeah, good question. So bronchiolitis is going to be in like a younger child, so less than 12 months. Not to say that you can't get it when you're older. Um, and also it's um, infective. So they might, they'll have like, might have a fever. They'll also have crackles as well, like on examination. Um and it'll be more kind of this gradual thing that's happening, whereas asthma will be an acute onset, um, like wheeze, chest tightness. They don't usually have crackles. They're not really infective. I mean, yes, they can have like a like a fever, like a viral in like a viral induced wheeze. Um, so I guess that makes it a bit different. But um, it'll be very clear on your exams as well, and you'll know that it's bronchiolitis because it'll be kind of this gradual onset. They'll have sick contacts. They'll be less than twelve months. They'll have the widespread wheeze, the crackles, the fever, and they'll be like dehydrated. Yep. Um, thank you. Another question about asthma: Do we need to know much about chronic management of asthma in like um, kids, adolescents, and teenagers kind of thing? No. I don't think so. It didn't come up for us in terms all, of our... Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, you go. No, I was just going to say it was mainly management, management, wasn't it? Yeah, I think if you're going to remember anything for management and peds for asthma, it's acute management. The burst therapy that we went through, I think that's really high yield. You can get a question on that and you can also get like a, probably an OSCE on that. I think chronic management, you'll probably have an older person and that will be in GP land. Um, yeah, any other questions? If anyone's got them, please feel free to send them through. Um, in addition, yeah, you can, just, you can just send them in the chat and then I can answer them as so the next person can do theirs. Yeah. In addition to getting 100% on the PEDS exam and winning the PEDS prize, Louise um, also got like a bunch of other commendations last year and she's going to the Alfred next year. So, like, if you have any questions at all, please feel free to send them through. Ooh, one came through. Let's see what that says. Um, for burst therapy, is it for, for Brett? Per puff, that's what someone's asked me. Sorry, what was that for burst therapy? Is it, is it four breaths per puff? Um, so oh gosh, this is testing me. So you do like um the puffs, like puff them in and then they yeah, they just keep breathing because it all goes into the spacer. So it's hard for children to like coordinate. So that's why we use a spacer. It's really important. So it's hard for children to coordinate like one puff, one breath. I think like I would struggle with coordinating that. Um, so you just puff it all into the spacer and that's why it's there because it can sit around in there and then they can just breathe it in as they go. Does that make does that make sense? I'm sure they'll let us know if it, if it doesn't. Another question: <laughs> How do I how do I ace the women's exam? Or oh, uh, yeah, I don't know how to answer that one. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, just know know the prompt guideline. Yeah. Sadly, yeah. And then another one saying, "How do I become you?" Um, I'm sure that's meant for you and not me. Because yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, we might take a quick five minute break before we get Rachel on just because we've been going for about two hours now. Um, feel free to set, keep sending questions through um, as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll just we'll just give it a, a quick break and then we'll come back after that in about five minutes. Thanks, guys.
All right, everyone. So our next lecture is going to be on neonatology and Rachel, our current co-chair of Muppets, is going to take us through that. Rachel's pretty much already a pediatrician. So everything that Rachel says is gold um, and, and you can, you know, lap it all up because it'll be, it'll be super high yield and, and really good. So um, take it away, Rachel. Thank you, Namek. Um, some lovely lies as usual. I will not pretend in any way to be an expert on neonatology. Um, but we'll give it a crack today. Um, if you do have questions, pop them in. I will probably not know the answer, but we'll give it a go anyway. <laughs> um, so the neonatology aspect of the matrix for you guys is pretty huge. Um, so today we'll be focusing on some of the bigger high yield topics, some of your R1s. Um, there is a large amount of content, which unfortunately we won't be able to cover in an hour today, um, but some of these topics are also covered in like respiratory and cardiology and surge, as well as um, in some of your women's health content. So um, hopefully today we'll be able to cover, cover the big things. <laughs> Um, but first of all, I just wanted to go through some more general um, things about neonates, um, because I feel like there is a lot of presumed knowledge about definitions and just things about newborn babies in general that isn't necessarily um, taught in our course. Um, so first of all, I've just got on this slide um, some information about some age groups and specifically around gestational ages. Um, so particularly for preterm neonates, um, gestational age um, is really important, both from a predictive perspective and also in terms of how um, we manage these infants. But I wanted to focus on the terms chronological age and corrected age, because um, I think this is an, a common point of confusion um, for students. So we use corrected age whenever we have a preterm infant, so someone who's less than 37 weeks, and we use it specifically when we're talking about their growth and development. Because as you can imagine, um, a bub that's born however many weeks early, we can't really expect to be at the same developmental and growth stages as their peers who were born at term. So the way that we calculate that is we work out their gestational age. So when, um, when they were born, so if they were born at 28 weeks gestation, we then minus that from 40, which where is what they should have been at term. Um, and then whatever that, um, that age is, so if it's a 28 week, it'd be a 12 week age gap. We then minus 12 weeks from whatever their normal chronological age from birth is. Um, so it's important to use that whenever we're plotting growth charts um, and also when we're thinking about developmental milestones like rolling and crawling and speaking um, and is a, a really important thing to also um, be talking to parents about um, because as you can imagine if they've got someone who they know who's also got a three-month-old but their three-month-old might actually be a lot more advanced um, because they were born at term as opposed to preterm. Um, next, I want to just briefly touch upon weight, because obviously weight is something that we measure really closely um, in the neonatal um, age ranges. Um, so I've just got some definitions on there um, regarding different terms we use when we talk about weight. So we can talk about weight with regards to whether um, an infant is born large for their gestational age or small for their gestational age, and we, we do that based on um, centiles. Um, we can then also classify their birth weight as being um, normal, low, very low, or extremely low. Um, these are important um, for management initially, and also because they give us predictive values with regards to kind of more longer term outcomes. Um, so things like cerebral palsy is going to be more common in um, infants who are born of extremely low birth weight. With regards to weight going forward after bub is born, um, so a 10% drop in birth weight is normal. Um, so in the first five days of life, um, babies will drop their birth weight. And it's often quite scary for parents to think that their baby is losing weight, but this is very normal, but it has they have to have regained that weight within the first um, two, two weeks of life. So that's, again, measured quite closely. And I've just popped up here in the corner as well, um, kind of some average weight gain per week, um, depending on the different months as well. So that's from some of the RCH guidelines. Um, and then with regards to measuring, Bub, as well, off some, or maybe on some of your placements, you've been asked um, to help um, weigh a baby. And so I've just popped some um, helpful hints as to how to do that as well. Um, and just making sure that when we're plotting weight, we're putting it um, on their corrected um, growth chart if need be. Um, so lastly, on our little kind of summary of neonates. Um, so what do neonates actually do? Um, so again, 
these things are probably less likely to be on your exam, but I thought they're just more useful things for day to day when you're on the wards, if you're working, um, you know, either in a maternity ward or um, in a special care nursery, just about what kind of things um, babies do. Um, so they spend a lot of time sleeping, they spend a lot of time feeding. Um, and with regards to their feeding, um, it can often be quite stressful for parents initially um, when um, trying to initiate that feeding and um, making sure that we're referring to lactation consultants and midwives really early to help um, support that. Um, in terms of vomiting, obviously this um, will be covered more in our GIT stuff, but um, small possets, so um, milky vomits are normal um, after a feed if they're small, um, but they should never be green. Green is always pathological. And in terms of um, bladder and bowel movements, so 24 hours is kind of our key marker as a general rule. Um, they have to have passed urine and passed their meconium within that first 24 hours. Otherwise, we start to get really worried that there might be um, some obstructive or other causes as to why that hasn't happened. Okay, so our first big topic, prematurity. This is obviously a huge topic and it also has a bit of overlap with women's, um, but we'll try to go through it as and summarize it as quickly as we can. So um, more generally, um, uh, bub is preterm if they are less than 37 weeks. And we then break down preterm further into moderate to late preterms, very preterms and extremely preterms. I've also just put up here something that you might, may have discussed in your um, women's health. And that's, um, I guess, when we're talking about extremely preterm um, infants um, and with regards to the types of active, when, when we would recommend active management versus when there is um, uh, this zone of parental discretion. We won't be going into that today, but just be aware of those timeframes as that might more come up in your women's, um, in your women's health discussions. Um, but the reason why prematurity is such a huge topic is um, it's really common and it's also a really large cause of morbidity and mortality um, for infants in Australia and around the world. Again, risk factors for preterm birth. This is stuff that hopefully um, he'll also be covering within your women's, um, women's health studies in terms of um, breaking it down. I think it's most useful to break it down into maternal factors, fetal factors and placental factors. Going into a few of these in a bit more data, detail, but some maternal um, factors such as P-PROM. So they may not necessarily in the exam say that they've got P-PROM, but they may have risk factors for it. So things like STIs, UTIs, being GBS positive. Um, cervical insufficiency is really anything that might mean that the cervix can um, uh, is, is going to dilate early. So if they've got a short cervix or if they've had any um, surgery to the cervix, either um, from like a, a loop excision um, from a previous cervical cancer. Uterine stretch um, can be things like um, twins or polyhydramnios. Um, and then in terms of fetal and placental factors, um, Fetal compromise, you're more looking, some uh, things that they might bring up is that, you know, they might be have a, a non-reassuring CTG or there might be other things that are indicating that um, that bub isn't, isn't doing so well. Um, and as a result, um, they, may, um, they may come early. Okay, so in terms of complications um, of prematurity, I've broken them up into short-term and longer-term complications and then tried to further break them down in, in, from a more systems-based approach. There are so many complications of prematurity. Um, I've tried to kind of list the, the biggest ones, um, but obviously this is um, not, a, not a finite list. <laughs> um, so in terms of cardiovascular, um, the biggest one is that they can have a patent ductus arteriosus, um, which is the communication between the pulmonary trunk and the descending aorta. And the failure of this to close um, means that we can get overload in those pulmonary vessels, which can lead to right heart strain and potentially heart failure if we do have that left to right shunt. From a respiratory point of view, probably the biggest thing is respiratory distress syndrome, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but other things such as pneumothoraces, which can be purely just due to prematurity, but often more likely to do with um, the need for mechanical ventilation um, early on um, as well. And then another um, thing can also be apneas. Um, and this is due to um, immaturity of the respiratory centers in the brain. Um, and sometimes we give bubs caffeine um, to help kind of stimulate um, the diaphragm to contract and stimulate those respiratory centers. From a GIT perspective, the biggest thing is neck. Again, we won't be going into too much detail about neck today, but um, the way that it'll present, um, you've got a bub who has a really distended abdomen. They might have bilious vomiting. Um, 
you they have kind of their, their abdomen appears almost like shiny shiny and distended so um they're kind of but buzzwords if you like about um for neck in terms of the x-ray um you've got these kind of gas bubbles in this um in the wall of the small intestines that eumatosis intestinalis i'm probably saying that wrong um um, and this is a medical emergency um, and requires um, a surgical referral um, immediately. From a neurological perspective, the biggest um, complication in the early period is intraventricular hemorrhage, um, which again can be broken down into grade one to grade four. Um, this is usually screened for on cranial ultrasound um, and going further on, particularly if they've got um, quite a, a severe grade four, they may need further MRIs and often follow up um, in some of our neurodevelopmental clinics, um, looking at more from a brain injury perspective. Renally, um, so but, um, premature infants will have um, immature kidneys as well, and so they can have electrolyte derangement as a result of that. Um, also, um, things like dehydration, if they're not able to feed well enough, is also going to cause some of those electrolyte disturbances. And then other, so you've got anemia of prematurity, hypothermia, so um, infants lose a lot of their body weight, which is why um, premature infants are kept um, in the little, um, the, the special little heated cots um, so that we can try to help regulate their body temperature as best we can. Um, and neonatal jaundice and sepsis we'll talk about a little bit later as well. In terms of longer term complications, some of these stem on from these earlier um, short term complications. So from a cardiovascular perspective, um, uh, heart failure of prematurity um, can sometimes occur, particularly if you have a PDA which has caused this significant right heart strain. Um, ways in which infants might present is with a failure to thrive, failure to feed, you might present with a tachycardia. Um, and in terms of our management, it's going to be, um, it's quite specialised, but we do still use some of our adult therapies such as ACE inhibitors and furosemide. Um, and it's obviously very dependent on, um, on the degree of the heart failure for those infants. Um, from a respiratory point of view, bronchopulmonary dysplasia um, is a complication of often respiratory distress syndrome, which is kind of that earlier, um, earlier respiratory complication. And chronic lung disease of prematurity is another term which is used quite a lot. And, and that's as a result of um, the pathological process that's happening in that earlier phase, as well as um, due to prolonged mechanical ventilation and um, the the immature development of those lungs. And we know now from research that some of these infants also go on um, to be high risk of developing more chronic lung diseases such as asthma as well. From a gastrointestinal perspective, um, so often because they have, again, due to the um, prematurity, they've got an immature suck um, and latching reflex. And so they can often be nutritionally deficient and some of them um, will need um, either nasogastric feeds or, or TPN. Um, as a result, some of them can have failure to thrive. Um, and again, to do a complicated mechanism to do with both the immaturity of the gastrointestinal systems, but also sometimes because of our interventions. So things like nasogastric, these infants can ongoing have issue, have oro, um, uh, what's the words, um, like oral aversion and um, have reflux and, and other issues going on into childhood as well. Um, from a musculoskeletal perspective, um, so because of some of the nutritional deficiencies, they can go on to develop things like rickett and osteomalacia. Um, so we monitor these quite closely um, in this early period. Um, from an, uh, in the eyes, so a retinopathy of prematurity is something that you might have heard of, and it's the reason why um, we down titrate the oxygen as much as we can um, for premature infants. Um, so oxygen is toxic um, to um, the neonatal brain as well as um, specifically to the eyes. Um, so you can get excessive um, vessel growth as a result of um, excessive oxygen um, in that neonatal period. And so all infants will have a fundoscopy at, at day 28 um, and we'll have that ongoing monitored um, because unfortunately often um, they do need the oxygen and so it's a, it's a really balancing act between that. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of their growth and development ongoing, um, we know that depending on the degree of prematurity, um, some of these children will go on to have developmental delays and, and growth delays. Um, 
In terms of cerebral palsy specifically, um, there are predictive tools that, that we can use in this early neonatal period um, that help us um, determine their risk of, of developing cerebral palsy. Um, so I know at Monash they have a neurodevelopmental clinic, um, which is run by one of the neonatologists as well as some of the physiotherapists where they do two specific assessments. Um, one's called a general movements assessment and one's a HINE. Um, and depending on things like tone, um, as well as abnormal posturing that they might see in the neonate, um, it's, it's strongly predictive of their risk of cerebral palsy. Um, and it means that you can initiate early intervention earlier um, for these children. Um, and another probably lesser known complication is that a lot of these um, premature infants do go on to have um, some cognitive issues um, as well as some psych, um, psych issues. And the most common is ADHD. Um, okay, that was a lot. <laughs> um, next, we are moving on to neonatal resus. Um, I might um, just pause to see if there are any specific questions about um, prematurity before we jump into neonatal resus. No, nothing's come through yet. I think you're just doing such a good job. I don't think there's any, any Amazing. questions. Amazing. Also, I've had a few coffees this morning, so if I'm talking too quickly, <laughs> please, everyone, just tell me to, tell me to chill out. Um, so moving on to neonatal resus. Um, so... First of all, um, APGARS, hopefully you guys are familiar with these, but this is um, an assessment that's done on um, any um, infant that's born. Um, and so I like this uh, little diagram here. I feel like it um, quantifies it quite nicely um, as to what you're looking for. Um, so the APGARS are not done immediately at birth. They're done at one minute, five minutes. And then if they're abnormal at five minutes, they're done again at 10 minutes. Um, and we use them because they help predict the need for resus immediately. Um, and also they tell us a little bit about the degree of distress um, that Bub was going through when they were being born. The best indicator of, a, of an infant that's not, not thriving and not doing well um, in that initial period is their tone. So you'll often hear um, people talk about them being flat or being floppy, and that's um, a, a poor predictive sign and they're likely going to need resus. Um, most commonly, um, bubs will come out and they'll have an apagar of nine because often the extremities are a little bit blue. Um, so some of you may have seen neonatal resus performed, some of you may have seen the equipment in the room, but just very quickly, the most hospitals in Australia will have what's called a resuscitaire, um, which has this little warmed cot at the bottom, as well as all of the positive pressure devices and oxygen that you need at the top here. In low resource settings, they'll have a neonatal bag and mask, um, which is more similar to what you would um, typically associate with bag mask in adults. Um, and this is just a close up of um, what the, the Neopuff looks like. So um, the Neopuff enables you to deliver positive pressure ventilation, either via CPAP or intermittent positive pressure ventilation. The way that it works, so this is a, um, a portable version of what's on here. So for CPAP, you set um, a, a PEEP, a pressure, and it's typically started at five. And so if you hold this mask over the infant over the infant, um, and don't occlude the hole, it's delivering um, a pressure of five, a PEEP of five. And as soon as you occlude that hole, it increases the pressure up to your, um, your inspiratory pressure. So most commonly, this will be set at 30 on five. So as soon as you occlude that hole, you're delivering um, a pressure of 30. And then when you release it, you're back on the PEEP of five. And that's how they deliver intermittent positive pressure ventilation in that resus situation is just by occluding that hole. Okay, so this diagram is the most important thing to learn for neonatal resus. It's what they will um, examine you on and it's also what you will use in the hospitals in everyday life. Um, so we'll just go through kind of each step of the flow chart here. So the main questions that you wanna ask in that first minute of life is, do you already know that this is a preterm baby that's going to need, likely going to need more respiratory support or are they term? Are they crying? Are they breathing? And do they have if, and do they have good tone? If you answer no to any of those questions, you want to start the timer. And that's something that as a medical student, you can definitely do. You can press that timer. Um, uh, and there's it's, often it's on that resuscitaire um, device. Um, and then you're going to start going through this pathway. So the first step in the pathway is warming and stimulating. So you'll often see um, when baby comes out, they'll grab baby, they'll pop them on mum, they'll give them a really good dry with a towel and they'll rub them really vigorously. And that's because we're trying to stimulate. And we know that that warming and stimulation is often 
all that babies need to then start and initiate that breathing. Um, but um, so that's always our first step. So um, if we're really worried, we might take we might cut the cord a little bit earlier and take them over to the resuscitator earlier. But otherwise, initially, it is we want to have that delayed cord clamping and have them um, skin to skin. Um, and yeah, the drying is literally just rubbing them with a warm towel. Next, we move on to airway. Um, so airway must be maintained in neutral. So you don't want to be providing excessive extension. Often because of the size of um, infant's occiput, they are in a more flex position at rest. And so you want to just bring them into that neutral position. You don't use any towels. You don't want to like bring them into like a sniffing or any position like that. You want them in perfect neutral. Um, previously, um, people were recommended to suction as well, but there's a lot of evidence moving away from suctioning the airway, um, particularly nasal suction, because we know that there um, is, is a reflex um, that can cause um, infants to, to aspirate um, if we do suction. So often, if we're worried, we go straight to, straight to breathing, which is your positive pressure ventilation. So... In terms of assessing breathing, if they are gasping, if they're having apneas, or if there's just no obvious breath sounds, or alternatively, if their heart rate, if you measure their heart rate and it's less than 100, you're commencing intermittent positive press pressure ventilation straight away. As I said, you're using that little lamp up device um, and you're starting on pressures of 30 on five. Depending on whether they're term or preterm determines your starting oxygen um, concentration and this varies a lot between hospitals and there's actually a really large multi-centre trial running at the moment called the Aeroplan trial, which is looking specifically at the optimum FiO2 um, for those moderate to late preterm infants because there's a bit of a gap in the literature at the moment. Um, but just follow your hospital guidelines if that's the case. And one thing to note um, with regards to your oxygen monitoring is you want to do pre-ductal um, SATs monitoring, which means it's on the right hand. And that's because that's the best indication of the oxygenation of the blood. So the um, specifically what's happening at the lungs, because if you're getting postductal, if there is an obstructive cause or, or there's something else going on, um, that's going to influence your, your saturations. Alternatively, if you have you have breathing, but it's it's a bit more laboured, they're working a bit harder, or they've got some persisting um, cyanosis or or, or um, discoloration instead of doing IPPV because they are um, able to breathe themselves, you're going to start CPAP and that's that five centimetres um, as we spoke about before. Moving on to circulation. So if at any point the heart rate is measured to be less than 60, we're going to commence chest compressions. Chest compressions are done in a three to one ratio um, and you would start, you would increase the oxygen to 100% and then titrate to SpO2. You're aiming to do 90 compressions a minute there are lots of different ways in which you can handle um, the baby to deliver um, the chest compressions. And I've put some images up here of different variations. If you're at this point where you're needing to do chest compressions, you're also then preparing um, for the next few steps, which is, is this um, infant gonna need intubation and do we need IV access for um, fluid resuscitation? So in neonates, particularly premature neonates, as you can imagine, very, very hard to get an, an IV line in. And so instead they do what's called an umbi line, um, which is catheterizing the um, umbilical vein. Um, and that's specifically to give that, that initial fluid resus. So if we're um, giving compressions and the heart rate's still less than 60, this is when we're then escalating onto our adrenaline and our fluid resus. Um, so I put the dosages of adrenaline there. Um, again, this is not expected knowledge um, for you guys at this point, um, but knowing the steps in this process, I think is, is probably reasonable to be um, examinable. Um, and in terms of our, our resus fluids, so um, we can give normal saline and um, packed blood cells. So if they've had a massive antipartum hemorrhage, if bubs really pale, they might consider giving packed red cells um, instead as well. Sorry, that's not going well, it's amazing. All right, so quick question. Um, baby is born at 39 weeks by forceps after non-reassuring CTG during the second stage of labor. At delivery, they're blue, apneic, and floppy. What is the most appropriate next step? Please don't feel like you have to chuck it in the chat, just, you know, mentally have a think about it.
So um, the answer is warm, dry and stimulate. And that is because this is the very first stage. So they've just been delivered. They're blue, apneic and floppy. Even though a bub that is blue, apneic and floppy is terrifying, um, we still need to follow that flow chart. So the first step is to warm, dry and stimulate. I'm sorry, my slides are loading really slowly at the moment. I think my computer is, um, is having a bit of a fit. Um, so moving on to respiratory conditions, um, some of this possibly has already been covered, but um, I just thought I'd go through it really quickly. Um, so the ones that we'll cover is TTN, MEC aspiration, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, um, as well as respiratory distress syndrome in more detail. Um, so I've just put this summary slide up of um, these three conditions um, and some really quick kind of um, key information about all of them. Obviously the big topic um, for respiratory in neonates is um, respiratory distress syndrome, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, but important things about TTN, so it's more common in a term, if they've had a C-section and if they're male, um, it's this effortless tachypnea. And so um, it's more a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, so you do still need to investigate for other causes. On X-ray, you see this fluid in the horizontal fissure, um, which is um, what you can see here. And they've often got really big lung volumes. Um, this often, thankfully, resolves quite quickly. So it can resolve within the first 72 hours. Um, and we just give them supportive, whether it's oxygen therapy or um, proning them for periods of time. Obviously, proning in a neonate is with constant supervision um, in that special care NICU. We otherwise wouldn't recommend tum um, children sleeping on their tummies. But that's a side point. Um, MEC aspiration syndrome. So um, this is literally where the infant has aspirated meconium. So they have passed their meconium um, in utero and then they have aspirated it. And this causes like a chemical pneumonitis, which is what you can see here on the X-ray. Um, and so more commonly, um, this happens in post-term neonates um, because they have kind of stayed in for a little bit too long and therefore have passed their MEC already. Or alternatively, if they're in, um, if there's elements of fetal distress, um, if you imagine like, you know, Bub like pooing their pants because they're scared and nervous or something, um, but that's how, that's how I remember it. So they're either really distressed and so they do a poo or um, they've been in there too long and so then they just do a poo. Um, so you see these um, patchy opacities, which is that chemical pneumonitis. And again, we give them, it's mainly supportive therapy, but it does take quite a, a bit longer to recover from. Um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a medical emergency. Um, sometimes this can be picked up um, a bit later, and that's when you might see a bub who has that typical scaphoid abdomen, which is where um, they've got like almost like a huge chest um, and then a really skinny tummy. Um, on chest x-ray, it's um, got this really characteristic picture where you can literally see bowel um, in the chest there. So it's where there's a herniation of the bowel through um, the diaphragm, um, diaphragmatic foramen um, into the chest. As a result, because this happens in utero, um, you also have, um, have a plastic development of the lung on that side. So you'll have a very, very small or almost insignificant lung on that side as well. Um, the most important thing is that we do not bag mask um, or give positive pressure to these. Um, we can't bag mask these um, neonates um, because obviously we're increasing that um, intrathoracic pressure in there as well, which is already really high with the bowel there. Okay, um, I promise not to bore you with embryology, but just very quickly, when we're talking about respiratory distress syndrome, it all relates back to surfactant. Um, so surfactant is produced by um, type two um, alveolar cells quite late in embryonic development. Um, so infants that are born prematurely um, may not have differentiated into those um, AT2 cells. And they're also going to have an immature immune system, which means that they're um, the macrophages and um, that are that help with the homeostasis of surfactant within the alveolus are also um, going to be immature. And so, as well as an absolute surfactant deficiency, they also have surfactant dysfunction. Um, so, if you remember back to preclin days, um, surfactant helps us to reduce the surface tension of the alveoli, which means that it's less likely to collapse um, when we have um, changes in our intrathoracic pressure. And so, without surfactant, it means that with respiration, we can have atelectasis of the alveoli. 
Um, so it was pre respiratory distress syndrome was previously known as highline membranous disease, um, but it's now known as respiratory distress syndrome, and it predominantly affects preterm neonates, um, and that is because of that surfactant deficiency and dysfunction, um, and it's characterized by abnormal um, respiratory function as well as um, hypoxia and hypoxemia. So um, biggest risk factor is preterm birth, um, and particularly if um, there hasn't been any maternal antenatal steroids. Um, very rarely you can have genetic surfactant deficiencies, but I would say more often than not, it's um, more to do with preterm. Um, complications of respiratory distress syndrome, we spoke a little bit about, but bronchopulmonary dysplasia as well as death and disability um, uh, uh, is the reason why um, it's such an enormous um, topic and an issue um, in neonatology. So clinical features is literally just an infant that is in respiratory distress. So tachypnea, nasal flaring, grunting, intercostal retraction, cyanosis. And I've put some pictures down here of, of what that might look like. Um, previously, um, for a diagnosis of RDS, you had to have radiological um, features of RDS, whereas now there's definitely a move towards this being a clinical diagnosis. And as soon as you have an infant with risk factors, so if they're preterm and they have signs of respiratory distress or an increasing FiO2 requirement, we are treating early. In terms of radiological features, which might come up on an exam, so you've got these ground glass opacities, so it's kind of um, homogenous the whole way across the lungs. You've got reduced lung volumes. Um, it's symmetrical on both sides. Um, and you have, if you can look really closely, you can see these air bronchograms, so the darker areas where you can see um, those air bronchograms coming through that more um, kind of consolidated picture there. So in terms of our management, there's things that we do, we can do to prevent it, such as the antenatal corticosteroids. Um, but in terms of what we can do when we have a, a bub who's presenting with um, RDS, the, the biggest things that are going to affect um, long-term prognosis is early initiation of non-invasive ventilation, such as CPAP, and most commonly this is nasal CPAP, um, and early surfactant replacement therapy. Traditionally, surfactant replacement, um, which is um, kind of exogenous surfactant, which has either been made synthetically or from animals, um, and it's literally um, like droppering in surfactant into the trachea and the lungs of these infants that don't have enough surfactant. Traditionally, that was only able to be done um, via intubation and mechanical ventilation, which has its own risk factors in itself. Um, so we know that mechanical ventilation increases rates of pneumothoraces as well as um, kind of chronic lung disease and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And um, it also has implications on um, uh, rates of intraventricular hemorrhage and things like that. So now the evidence is more moving towards trying to avoid intubation and mechanical ventilation wherever possible. And so there are two new techniques, um, which you may have heard either on the wards or in your lectures, um, which is MIST and LISA. So it's minimally invasive surfactant therapy or um, less invasive surfactant administration. And this is where uh, we'll stay on CPAP um, and either using McGill's forceps or a laryngoscope, they then insert a thin catheter through the vocal cords and then um, um, instill in little aliquots um, surfactant through those catheters um, into the trachea directly and then remove it afterwards. So they stay on CPAP the whole time. They don't need to have a tube put in and they don't need to be mechanically ventilated. If they need mechanical ventilation for another reason, if um, they would need it anyway, um, then it would still be done via um, intubation and mechanical ventilation. Okay, next question. Um, so baby's born at 30 weeks following a spontaneous labor, delivery is unremarkable. They're noted to be grunting with an increased work of breathing and reduced oxygen saturations. And this is their chest X-ray. What could it be? <laughs> um, so this again is a very typical um, presentation for respiratory distress syndromes. So we've got a premature infant um, who has got some signs of increased work, of, increased work of breathing and respiratory distress. And on this chest X-ray, we've got these ground glass capacities with the air bronchograms. All right, spot diagnosis. Oh, 
hopefully so a few of you have got it so this is the congenital diaphragmatic hernia and this is the scaphoid abdomen that we were talking about before so unfortunately this is a whole lot of bowel in the chest here okay moving on to sepsis um, we've got some very big topics coming up, I apologize. Um, so I'll try to go through these as quickly as I can. Um, I've broken down neonatal sepsis into early and late. Um, we won't talk through all of these um, things. I won't read off the slides, um, but these are all here for you guys to refer back to later. Um, some things that they like to um, that they like you to know is, I guess, differentiating between perhaps different pathogens um, that might be more common in early versus late. So the big thing with early onset sepsis is, um, if you think about, it's really sepsis that's occurred um, either in utero or during birth, which is why GBS and E. coli are our two biggest contributors um, to early onset sepsis. Um, We've also got um, some less common ones or some other ones that could be more of your um, congenital like kind of torch-like infections as well. Um, in terms of our late onset sepsis, we want to think of more of these as things that um, infants could have been exposed to either in the NICU and in the hospital or outside of hospital if they've already gone home. And the reasons why we differentiate them is because we treat them with different antibiotics because we need to treat the different types of bugs. Um, most hospitals will use um, an early onset sepsis risk calculator. This is the one um, that Monash use. And so um, often um, at birth, they'll, they'll do this calculation um, because that will help guide them as to whether or not we want it, how early we want to start antibiotics. Um, as well as just putting in all of these predictive factors, there's also um, a section which relies on their clinical presentation, which in some ways is um, sometimes used given more weight um, so even if they have a low risk here, but they're actually really worried based on how they're presenting clinically, they'll often still get those empirical antibiotics. So neonatal sepsis can be incredibly nonspecific. Um, people will say that like if a neonate looks at you sideways, it could be sepsis, so like start treating. Um, and the reason why we treat so aggressively and so early is because the mortality rate is horrifically high. Um, so any change in vitals or symptoms can be sepsis. So we have to screen um, really quickly. Um, the absence of fever does not mean it's not sepsis. So um, more than a third are normothermic. Um, and sometimes neonates, because they can't temperature regulate as well, um, can become hypothermia can um, be an indication that this could be sepsis. Um, again, I've tried to group it into um, kind of a systems-based approach. Um, so you can use this for your revision. Um, I guess some of the bigger um, conditions that we think about with sepsis, one of them is neonatal meningitis. Um, in neonates, often they don't have those overt signs of meningism that we're used to learning, like the Koenigs and Brudinskis and um, all of those things. They might present with more general generalised symptoms. They might have be vomiting, but some specific things to look for would be a bulging fontanelle, which can tell us that they've got a raised ICP. Um, definitely if there's any seizures, we're incredibly worried that this could be um, meningitis or encephalitis. Um, and uh, there's a very specific cry um, that pediatricians would talk about. It's like this shrill, high-pitched cry um, that is strongly associated um, with neonatal meningitis. Um, in terms of like a neonatal pneumonia, again, we're looking for those signs of increased work of breathing. So the tachypnea, the nasal flaring, any slight change in their oxygen saturations that might flag that this um, child might have sepsis. So in, we, in terms of our septic screen, it, it's similar to um, what we would do in adults, um, except that chest X-ray and LP, as you can imagine, we want to, um, LPs can be quite tricky. <laughs> Um, in, in, uh, to, in infants of this age. Um, but if we are worried about meningitis or encephalitis, um, it's something that we need to consider. Um, in terms of prophylaxis, hopefully if we are worried that there might be a risk of early onset sepsis, um, we, might, we may have already given um, Benpen um, intrapartum. Um, so in, in terms of our, I guess, management, when we are suspicious that there might be sepsis, again, um, we're dividing this into early and late. So early onset, Ben, Pen and Gent, and that's because um, of the organisms that we're wanting to treat, namely GBS. 
whereas late we're giving flucloxingent. And again, that's to do with the staph and strep organisms that are more likely um, to cause late onset sepsis. Depending on the hospital you work in, the guidelines will differ greatly. Um, you will notice that if you look at Monash's prompt guidelines versus the RCH guidelines, they give very different antibiotic recommendations. The reason for that is for early onset sepsis um, via the Monash prompt guidelines, the recommendation is Ben Pen and Gent. And that is because we are assuming that the neonate has given birth at that hospital and not left that hospital. So they haven't gone into the outside world. They haven't been exposed to the typical bugs that children presenting to the royal children's might have. So in, on the next slide, I've got the RCH guidelines, which give a different set of antibiotics for those less than seven days. But for your exams, learn early onset sepsis is Benpen and Gent and late onset is Fluclox and Gent. We then modify it slightly if we're worried about neck or if we're worried about meningitis or if there's some risk factors for HSV, but they're probably the two big ones um, to remember. Um, when One thing that's probably a bit different with neonates is when we're trying to get a urine MCS. So the most accurate way to do this is via a super pubic aspirate, which is like a little, like you like inject into the, <laughs> directly in um, via the abdomen. Um, and then in terms of our IV fluid, resus and supportive care, it's similar to what we would um, with um, any infant, so it's a 10 mil per kilo bolus, and then we're escalating up as need be. So these are the ICH guidelines. As you can see, less than seven days, it says Ben Pen and Kevataxime. I would just delete this from my memory. It just caused me a whole lot of issues because I, obviously we all go to the RCH guidelines for most things, but just know that they're a bit different between the Monash guidelines. Okay, last big topic <laughs> is neonatal jaundice. So um, this, uh, I certainly found very confusing when I was learning it. So I've tried to break it down as much as I can. Um, I will credit some of these beautiful diagrams um, Nicole made these last year when she did this presentation. And I just think they uh, very, were well, not only beautiful and colorful, but they also broke it down really nicely. So um, first of all, why are neonates at increased risk of neonatal jaundice? And it's because the red blood cell life cycle is shorter in neonates. So the life cycle of a red blood cell is usually what, like 120 days, whereas neonates, it's like 30 to 40 days. So therefore we have increased red blood cell turnover and therefore increased unconjugated bilirubin bilirubin, which gives us that unconjugated bilirubinemia. In addition to that, what normally breaks down our unconjugated bilirubin, what normally helps um, conjugate it, the gluconal transferase, um, works at 1% of the efficiency to what it does in adults. So we have more unconjugated bilirubin because the red blood cells are turning over more quickly. And we also have uh, the gluconal transferase. It isn't really working very well. It works at like 1%. It's barely doing anything at all. So therefore we already have a situation where neonates are going to be presenting more jaundice. So why do we care? And the reason is conicterus. So conicterus is when you have un unconjugated bilirubin, um, which has um, crossed the blood brain barrier and is binding in areas of the brain, such as the basal ganglia. So it's incredibly toxic to the brain at high concentrations and can cause encephal encephalopathy and permanent brain damage. So this is why we care about it, because um, it can be devastating. Um, one important thing to note when we're talking about un unconjugated versus conjugated bilirubin, as I mentioned, unconjugated bilirubin from that breakdown of the red blood cells can be physiological and can be normal. Conjugated bilirubinemia, where you have increased conjugated bilirubinemia, is always pathological. So it always indicates that there's an obstruction or hepatic disease. We'll break it down in a little bit more detail in a second. This is again, another flow chart of the bilirubin cycle. We won't go through that today, but it's there for your reference. And this is again, another beautiful little diagram that Nicole made last year. Um, it's also um, mirrors uh, what the You're Kidding Right podcast, how they talk about neonatal jaundice, which I think is a really nice way to think about it. So there's two different ways that you can kind of think about neonatal jaundice. Um, the first is in terms of timing. So less than 24 hours, 24 hours to two weeks and more than two weeks. So too early. And then in the middle is nuts too high. And then at the end, it's nuts gone on for too long. The other way 
is to think about it in under unconjugated versus conjugated. So all of these uh, orange ones are unconjugated and then the purple ones are conjugated. So this is how this is kind of what we'll be working off today. And we're going to start with thinking about, so in this first less than 24 hours is always pathological. So for less than 24 hour old neonate has neonatal jaund has jaundice and has a, a high bilirubin, it, there's always something going on. It's not physiological. There's always something pathological going on. And a good way to, yep, a good way to talk about it is the rule of twos. So bear with me. <laughs> so less than 24 hours, it's too early. So just think two, it's too early. It can either be hemolysis or sepsis. So there you two, one and two, hemolysis or sepsis. Within hemolysis, again, two, it can be extrinsic or intrinsic. Within extrinsic, it can be ABO or recess. And within intrinsic, it could be hereditary or G6PD. Then moving down to sepsis, it can either be um, early onset sepsis, so your GBS, or it could be due to torch. I don't know if that helps. That helped me <laughs> thinking about it, but there's always um, two differentials. So breaking it down a little bit more detail, so um, hemolysis, so in that very early phase, we could either have extrinsic hemolysis happening because we've got an ABO or a rhesus incompatibility. Things to look for in the stem if you've got um, a neonatal jaundice early on is that you have an O, uh, a mother with an O blood group, because if baby is A or B, you're going to have that ABO incompatibility and that possible hemolysis. Or if you have, um, uh, in terms of rhesus um, incompatibility, they'll often talk about there being a sensitizing event, whether that is this is a second pregnancy or whether um, they have had a miscarriage or whether they have had um, an amniocentesis or, or something that's caused um, a possible sensitizing event during pregnancy. In terms of intrinsic, so this is stuff that's going on within, I think about it like within the blood cells. So you can, these are two genetic conditions, hereditary spherocytosis, which is autosomal dominant, and G6PD deficiency, which is X-linked. I've added in the recessive patterns because for whatever reason, last year Monash loved testing us on the inheritance patterns of niche rare blood diseases. I would say it's very low yield, but it's there if you want to know it. <laughs> um, and then in terms of sepsis, we've spoken a little bit about um, that as well, but that can obviously also um, cause um, the, it can also cause neonatal jaundice. So in terms of our history, these are some things that we're asking. And then in terms of investigations, transcutaneous bilirubin is like a, um, like a, a pinprick test that they, um, like a little test that they can do on the skin, um, which is a good, really quick test of the bilirubin, um, but not necessarily as reliable. Um, so then we would also want to do a serum bilirubin and then breaking that down into conjugated and un unconjugated. Um, a direct Coombs test, um, which you'll know um, is looking um, for the antibodies. Hemolytic screen is the exact same as what you would have learned in adults um, and septic screen, as we spoke about before. Um, within that, we also want to have a look at the blood film um, because obviously the blood film is going to tell us more about these intrinsic um, causes of hemolysis. Um, so then moving on into this middle category, which is it could be physiological, it could be normal, or it could be too high. So if it's um, physiological, as I said, it's because um, of that really short lifespan of the red blood cells and the liver can't quite process it quickly enough. Um, and it should resolve within those first few weeks, but we still need to consider all of these other ones. However, if our um, unconjugated, un unconjugated bilirubin is really high, we might be considering more of these um, other factors. Breast milk jaundice and breastfeeding jaundice are annoyingly um, sound very similar. <laughs> but um, if you try to break it down into breast milk jaundice, so the theory is that the actual breast milk is further inhibiting the gluconal transferase in the liver, and so therefore there's less conjugation. At no point for any of these things do we stop breastfeeding. We always continue with breastfeeding. 
um, and but we may need to give them additional supplements as well. Breast feeding jaundice, um, there's more um, an issue that perhaps they're not getting enough milk. So the questions that we were asking is, you know, how are they latching? How often are they um, drinking? Um, how much are they having? How frequently? And so I guess we can think about this more as um, almost like a, a dehydration kind of thing as well. Um, so in addition to um, our other tests that we did before, we'd also perhaps look at BSLs um, and UECs. Um, and we may try encourage um, increased breastfeeding or start supplements as well in this instance. Um, polycythemia um, can also be a cause of, of um, jaundice in this age range. And some of the causes that you may have learned from um, your women's matrix is GDM um, can cause um, a polycythemic baby. So that really big kind of red baby. <laughs> Um, as well as delayed cold clamping, because obviously we're just getting um, more, um, more blood um, into that up. In terms of inherited syndromes, Gilbert syndrome, um, which you will have known from adults, can similarly cause neonatal jaundice. Um, and same as before, we've still got our hemolysis and our sepsis. The other thing to consider, I guess, after that first 24 hour period is that if we do have any scalp bleeding um, or trauma from birth, um, the breakdown of that bruise can also be contributing to hemolysis and therefore um, the, uh, the bilirubinemia as well. Lastly, um, if we have a jaundice that's um, persistent over two weeks, um, we, again, this is always pathological. It shouldn't, physiological jaundice should ideally um, resolve within those first two weeks. Um, so I've broken this one. So this is the only one where we start to talk about conjugated bilirubinemia. So that's where the conjugated portion of the bilirubin is higher than the unconjugated. In terms of conjugated bilirubinemia, I think about them as kind of livery, like livery bile things and then really weird and wonderful metabolic things. So the two livery bile things <laughs> is biliary atresia, which is where you have kind of the absence of that biliary tree. And in exams, they'll often give you an image and you can see there are just no, no bile ducts at all and or no um, like a contracted or absent gallbladder um, in, um, in that image there. This is commonly associated with um, allergial syndrome. Um, so they may also talk about um, the infant having a butterfly vertebrae or pulmonary stenosis and other things associated with allergial. Um, and clinically they'll have pale stools um, is an important buzzword to remember. Um, the other condition um, in, for a conjugated bilirubinemia is uh, cholidocal cysts. So these are these cystic dilations in the bile ducts, which you can see here. Um, and they will also have pale stools, but the differentiating factors on ultrasound, they'll have these really dilated um, intra and extra hepatic ducts here. Other causes of conjugated bilirubinemia are rare metabolic disorders. There are lots of different rare metabolic disorders which can cause this. Probably the one that, um, the only one that I've ever seen um, kind of come up and spoken about is galactosemia, which is an autosomal recessive disorder where they essentially can't break down galactose and lactose. Um, so they can initially present really well at birth, um, but then they'll present with poor feeding, vomiting, hepatomegaly, as well as jaundice. Um, it's also associated with cataracts. Um, and it can also, they also, um, the, the toxins and, and products can also cause um, issues with the brain and, and developmental delay. And so uh, management of this is a complete avoidance of lactose and galactose. So this is the only time where you would stop breastfeeding um, at this point, but this is extremely rare in Australia. Um, it's actually quite common in Ireland, um, but very rare in Australia. So just think about rare metabolic disorders is another cause of conjugated bilirubinemia. Um, other causes of unconjugated, so again, more like livery stuff. So you need hepatitis. Um, so it can be, it can be, you can have idiopathic neonatal hepatitis. Um, otherwise, um, your, your normal hepatitis um, causing viruses such as your hep Bs, um, can also cause neonatal hepatitis. Um, other causes, congenital hypothyroidism. Um, so these infants will have a very characteristic phenotype. So they'll have um, core, what's called coarse faces. They'll be really floppy. Um, they may have an umbilical hernia. Um, they've got very dry skin. Um, and so we'd investigate this like we would normally with um, thyroid function tests as well as potentially thyroid antibodies. 
Um, and then other causes that can persist longer than this period of time is also your breast milk jaundice and your um, hemolysis as well. Um, in terms of what we do, um, this all determine this is all dependent on our nomogram here. So uh, we plot what the um, serum bilirubin, so that's the one that's from the blood, not just the transcutaneous, but the serum. Um, we plot the serum bilirubin um, on our nomogram, and it tells us, depending on the age of the infant, um, whether or not they score phototherapy or whether or not they get exchange transfusion. Uh, so phototherapy is those lovely blue lights that you may have seen in the NICU. Um, and what that does is it essentially breaks down the bilirubin and means that they can excrete it in their urine without um, needing it to be conjugated. Um, the biggest uh, risk factor for uh, phototherapy is retinal damage as well as skin damage. So you'll often, you'll see them have their little sunglasses on when they do it. Um, so that is probably the more common one that you've seen. Um, if it's really severe, um, exchange transfusion is where they're literally um, removing the blood and replacing it. Um, but that is um, only in very, very severe. Um, but they're the two ones and we determine it based on the nomogram. Um, so I've got a couple of questions. I'm aware of the time. So I might leave these questions for um, you guys at the end. And just very quickly jumping to our um, R2 topic, which is birth trauma. Um, birth trauma, obviously there's a lot that you can cover in birth trauma, but I feel like the two big topics is our scalp bleeds um, and then our brachial plexus injuries. So I've just put in a little summary of um, the, the three main types of scalp bleeds um, that you need to know about. Um, the reason why they want us to know about this is because a subgalil hemorrhage is a medical emergency and um, has a really high mortality rate um, and so is really important to be able to identify. The difference in the bleeds is based on where in the skull they are, which is why I find this um, diagram quite useful. Um, so the kaput um, is um, we've got the serosanguinous fluid accumulating um, in this layer, in the subcutaneous layer of the scalp here. Um, it can cross the suture line, so it can go across here, um, but it usually resolves between 12 to 18 hours. Because it does cross the suture lines, it can be confused with the subgalil. Um, so both the subgalil and kaput cross suture lines, whereas the cephalohematoma does not because it's confined um, within this periosteum here. Um, if you are suspicious of a subgalil, um, it's a medical emergency, you want to escalate immediately. Often these, um, if you're not at a tertiary hospital, these infants need to be piped out very quickly um, and they can lose 70% of their blood in a very short amount of time um, from this bleed. So it's um, very serious. Um, you need to do urgent um, group and cross match and essentially pipe them out to a centre that can manage them. Uh, lastly, brachial plexus injuries. Um, so you will have come across some of these perhaps earlier in your studies as well. Um, the herbs and Klumke's palsy are the two most common um, and it's um, dependent on where um, in the brachial plexus that kind of traction has occurred. Um, the degree of paralysis and the degree um, and the extent of it is, depend is very variable. Um, so if you are suspicious of this at birth, it's important that you refer early um, for a physiotherapy assessment um, who then work quite closely um, with the plastic surgeons in terms of whether or not this needs surgical repair. Um, more often than not, um, with physiotherapy, they, um, they, they don't all need surgical repair, um, but more severe ones do. Um, you'll learn about the risk factors, again, in more in your women's, um, but bigger babies, smaller pelvises, um, shoulder dystocia, um, difficult deliveries are all going to put um, you at risk of that traction. And it's that traction, um, that kind of separation of the head from the shoulder there that's going to traction those um, nerves in the brachial plexus. Um, if you have a brachial plexus injury, it's also important to also um, check for a possible clavicle fracture. Um, more often than not, these can be managed conservatively, um, but we just need to um, provide education about handling um, in that period of time as well. Okay, 
I think that's me done. I'm sorry that was a lot. I'm sorry I, I feel like I talked to them a million miles an hour. Um, but thank you all uh, for sticking around. Um, lots of acknowledgements there to um, different resources that have helped as well as Nicole um, with her lecture last year. Um, but I'll stop it there if there are any questions. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I haven't had any questions come through unless you've got some sent to you directly. Um, might be worth checking. There's a question here about uh, indications and antibiotics for meconium aspiration syndrome. That is beyond my scope of knowledge. Um, <laughs> I would say that um, it's probably also beyond the expected knowledge of you guys for your exam um, next year, uh, this year as well. Um, and for all, uh, particularly with neonates, um, antibiotic guidelines are going to differ depending on the centre that you're at. But also just in general, actually, um, neonatal guidelines differ centre to centre. Um, the safer care guidelines for Victoria, um, uh, they don't have a neonatal division anymore. <laughs> and so the guidelines haven't actually been updated since I think like 2017, 2018. Um, and so all the guidelines for neonates are very centre specific, um, which means there is a vast degree of variation between what people do. Um, for your exams, um, I would go off the Monash prompt guidelines because um, they're what your exams are written off. And then depending on where you're working, um, you should have hospital specific guidelines for all of those things. Perfect, thank you, Rachel. Um, if anyone has any other questions, no? Cool. All right. Um, so we'll just break for lunch now until maybe about 1230. Is that, that enough time? Or do you guys feel like you need a bit longer? Tiff, Izzy, what do you guys think? I think no. we'll come back at 1230. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 1230 sounds good then. See you guys back at 1230. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you.
All right, we might get started then. So I'm just going to start off with MSK and same deal, you know, feel free to jump in, stop me at any point, ask me any questions you like. Happy to sort of go as you guys want. Um, I'll start off by... All right, so I've just sort of set this up in terms of like questions that you might get on the exam and then we'll just go through each condition and I've just kept it like super like brief because MSK is not really like that high yield in terms of, we, we did get a lot of questions last year, but it's it's more so like what's the, what's the diagnosis, what's the management, very straightforward questions. So, all right, so you have a four-year-old boy comes into ED with a limp and he's refusing to wait bare. And then on examination, you note that his knee's hot, swollen, and painful. And his vitals are pretty normal, except for a temperature that's a little bit high. So what, what, what would we think this is? If you're happy to send it through in the chat, oh, I'm getting a few answers. Septic arthritis. Yep, very good. Um, can't get to the next slide. Okay, cool. So the main set of giveaways there is that the kid's got a limp. He's refusing to wait there, which is pretty common in, in something like septic arthritis because of how painful the joint will be. Um, and it's a hot, swollen, tender joint. So like that's very, that's a very good giveaway that it's um, septic arthritis and that there's usually there might be things like a, it might say something like an effusion or there's significant inflammation um, as well. In terms of, I guess, if the child was hypotensive and tachycardic as well, and they were very febrile, then I guess that would indicate more, more so that this is now spread to sepsis and, and your management would sort of change a bit differently there because it might the child might need some acute resuscitation. But the definitive management here is is IV antibiotics in the form of flucloxacillin. And I think that came up last year. So it might be just good to, to remember that. Um, you don't need to perform a joint aspirate prior to and giving antibiotics. So if the question says something like, oh, what will be the next step in management? And it it would probably if it wanted you to choose between joint aspirate and antibiotics, it would say something in the stem like um you know, uh, and then the closest person able to perform the examination is two hours away or something like that. It would be very obvious which you have to do. It won't be like sort of, oh, wishy-washy. Um, but if there ever is like a, a chance that there might be a delay, then you go just antibiotics first because that's a priority. Um, all right, so Beatrice, five-year-old girl, comes in to the local GP with a limp. She appears well. And there's no localized features on any of the major joints, but her mother mentions that Beatrice had a cold about a week ago. So what, what does this sound like? Oh, a few messages there. Yep, <laughs> everyone's saying transient sign of light. It's very good. Um, uh, yep, so uh, giveaways there is that you know, limp, systemically well, no localizing features. So that's very typical of, of transient synovitis. There won't be like an effusion. There's not usually any erythema or anything like that. Um, the child looks pretty well, uh, but they just sort of have a limp because the synovium sort of inflamed as a as a post-viral sort of inflammation, inflammatory reaction in response to uh, the, the infection that they had uh, usually about one to two weeks ago. Um, and this is how the questions will sort of present. And I'm sure you would have seen them from the practice Muppets questions or past papers that you would have looked at. They're usually pretty straightforward. And this is the kind of thing that you get. Um, if it's straightforward like this and there's no sort of worrying symptoms or any red flags, then the management there is that no additional re uh, investigations are required. Um, and, and you can just sort of safety net reassure the parent of, of the, uh, you know, that this is sort of self-limiting. It'll go away. And then to represent if there's any sort of issues or concerns. All right, um, eight-year-old type one diabetes comes in with a limp, refusing to wait there, and then points to pain over her distal leg. Um, there's no associated erythema or effusion, but then bone MRI shows uh, bone marrow edema and uh, the absence of subperiosteal abscess. What do you guys think this one is? Yep. So I'm getting osteomyelitis OM. Yes, that's right. So this is this one's a bit sneaky. Like it's not very clear cut that it's it's osteomyelitis, but usually how they'll present is uh, 
with they it won't they won't be any effusion or or erythema usually um or at least for your exams and it'll have some sort of mri finding and the mri findings that they usually uh, give you is uh, bone marrow edema and or some periosteal abscess and the reason that the periosteal abscess is is important is because that d- dictates how you manage so for example if there is no abscess then iv antibiotics alone in the form of flucloxacillin will be significant enough or sufficient but if there is an abscess then they need the antibiotics in addition to surgical debridement um yep Hope that makes sense. And in terms of their symptoms, usually the, you know there'll be a limp. There won't be anything too specific, but and they can have a fever, but it's it's not ne- it's not as acute or as severe as it might be in something like septic arthritis, because the information, the, sorry, the inflammation and infections are a bit more contained within the bone um, and not sort of spreading around in the blood like it would be in something like septic arthritis. Okay, so sixteen month old comes to ED with a fracture in the mid shaft his tibia. Mum reports that he sustained a fracture after falling from a standing height after he slipped on a toy two days ago. This one's a bit tricky, but what do you guys think that this one might be? Yep. Yep. So I'm getting non-accidental injury. Yeah. And that's it. So um, the red flags there is that the kids, the child's quite young. Um, it's a fracture in a young child, which is always sort of a, a concern or something to think about. Um, uh, the location as well, mid shaft of the tibia, not not commonly fractured. And I'll go through which fractures are likely as well. Um, and then a fall from a standing height. So incompatible mechanism of injury. Sorry, incompatible mechanism of how the injury might have come about, like it's not. And then two days as well. So delayed presentation or delayed help seeking. Um, so like of all the things that you sort of go through, like, you know, like neonatal resus, all those things are very important. Um, but this is like one that you might see as a, a junior doctor. And it's one that's important not to miss, you know? So like, and we always get a question on the exam about this probably because it, it is so important. Um, but usually the question and the question on the exam will be very obvious. Like it'll have like multiple red flags. Um, but some of the red flags might be that the child has multiple sites of bruising, um, that the blues, bruisings are of, often in, uh, covered by, in areas that are covered by clothes or clustered, um, and that the the way that the fr- uh, uh, fracture sort of came about is incompatible with how you sort of think about fractures normally. Like they might have just fallen and they they broken a shoulder, which is not really not really possible unless the child has some sort of deficiency or, or, or disease. Um, and then also like things like burns in a child that's non-ambulating, like you, I think the question that we had said, or a practice question said something like there were burns on the child's feet, but they were like 12 months old. So like, how did they get into the water kind of thing? So those are just things to think about. Um, and they can be quite, you know, quite sad, but it's just important to be aware. Um, and then also just making sure that, uh, in terms of the management, that it's just straight away sort of escalate to a senior member of staff, and then they will perform a top to toe examination. But in terms of uh, management, I guess if the, you, you first you medically stabilize this child and then escalate to a senior, but that sort of happens together, if that makes sense. But always doctors, ABCDs, and then escalate to a senior. All right, cool. So two-year-old presents to the local GP with a limp. My mother mentions that she's been worried about her daughter's gait she, she, since she sort of started walking three months ago. Uh, and on examination, you know, a waddling gait and discrepancy in leg length. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah. DDH, perfect. Um, yep, DDH is correct. Sorry. So two-year-old with a limp. And the giveaway here is that she's been sort of concerned about her gait since she started walking. So like it's 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 not a new thing. It's been there for a while. Um, and that discrepancy in leg length. So this one can come up quite a bit, and you might even get an OSCE on it potentially. But the risk factors, I'm sure you're aware from women's health and, and all that, that being female, being breached, and any sort of condition that causes confinement in utero, so being a part of a multiple pregnancy, being a large baby, or increased sort of amniotic fluid can all compress the, the legs and cause DDH. Um, the complications of it sort of are that you can have early onset osteoarthritis, you can have loose sort of ligaments and, and easy dislocations, and then uh, the avascular necrosis of the femoral head, which we'll come to in a second when we discuss another condition um, as well. But in terms of, I guess, how these things present and how they're managed for each 
age. So if they're asymptomatic, sorry, sorry, if they're, if they're less than six months, they'll likely be asymptomatic because no one's sort of walking around when they're less than six months. Um, and the way that it sort of presents, it might be that there's Barlow's and Ortolani signs, like that might be the, the giveaway in the exam. And they might get an, uh, an ultrasound, but the management is usually um, a harness or a brown low bar. Um, and, and that's that might fix it. But if it if it goes undetected or if you know now it's six to eight eighteen months and it's still sort of causing them issues, then the way that that might present in someone that's a little bit older is with a reduced ability to sort of abduct their hip. Um, Barlow's and Ortolani sort of go away and they're not no they they're not present anymore, so you can't really rely on those signs. But another thing that you might see is asymmetrical gluteal folds, um, which you might have heard of as well. And an ultrasound is not necessary, but it might be performed. Um, but the way that this is managed is that the child is sort of sedated and how they do it is they, without making an incision, they surgically sort of perform a reduction and put the hip back into place. But there's no in, there's no incisions. And then the child goes into this hip speaker cast here, which you can see here. Um, and, it, and it has to be like that for six weeks or, yeah. Um, in terms of how an older child might present, so they will have hip pain, pain referred to the knees, they'll have a, a gait abnormality, and then also a, a leg length discrepancy, which is what was in this question here. Because um, And then also they'll have toe walking to compensate, so they have to elongate one leg to compensate for the fact that the other one is shorter. Um, might order an MRI to work out what's going on here, but then this is managed by open reduction. So that's with an incision under general anesthetic that's then used to uh, relocate the hip back into its, sorry, relocate the, the leg back into the correct position. Okay, cool. Um, Eight-year-old boy presents to ED with hip pain. On examination, you know, pain on internal rotation of his left hip and then an X-ray shows. Okay, you guys are already sending three answers. What have we got? Perthes, perthes. Cool. Cool, very good. Um, so giveaways here is that, that on X-ray, you will have increased joint space and a flattened femoral head. And you can see that here in the picture here, um, that there's increased joint space and the flat uh, femoral head here in comparison to the one on the other side. Uh, but it it's um, usually presents with reduced ability to internally rotate slash decreased range of motion slash a limp. Um, but they won't usually expect you to diagnose it on history alone. It'll 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 be some. They'll give you something like uh, the findings of an X ray. Um, they won't. Uh, they don't normally give you an X ray. I don't think I've ever seen that on a practice question or anything like that. But um, it'll say something like an increased joint in space and a flattened head. Yep. Pretty straightforward. Cool. Cool. Yeah, but someone sent through sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, Sufi, there we go. Yeah, perfect. Um, that one, that's a Sufi. And the giveaway there is that it's, it's usually, um, uh, uh, an overweight sort of child during a growth spurt. So this boy here is 12 years old. Um, it's a dull pain, so it's it's less sort of acute than the other ones, than, than, than um, uh, Perthes. Um, and the, the leg will be sort of shortened and externally rotated, if that makes sense. And you can dis distinguish from this from DDH because it's, you know, there's a leg length. Dis it's not necessarily like a leg length discrepancy. It's just that the leg happens to be shorter because of how... Uh, because of the pathology here, not necessarily because one leg is sort of shorter than the other or anything like that. Um, but it, again, it's an urgent orthopedic referral and you'll get the the buzzword there is that the child is overweight and going through a, a growth spurt um, and that it's shortened and externally rotated. Cool. Um, these ones don't really come up that much in terms of answers, but they do come up as options. So it's just good to be familiar with yourselves. It's the same with the, some of the cardiology ones that Natty was going through. Um, they don't, they're not, no, they don't normally ask you about um, these things for them to be answers, but they'll might throw them in there as distractors. But um, maybe one that does come up a bit is Osglut Schlatter, like that one's seen in sort of older kids and older athletes, and you get like a tenderness over their TBR, um, but it sort of goes away. And what you really just do is 
modify their activity so they're not overusing their joints as much so that you just ask them to play a different sport or, or do something else. Uh, but yeah, does that make sense? Any any questions about any of that MSK stuff? It's pretty straightforward. It's not too bad. Okay, might move on. Might move on to neurology now then. Um, I'll just... Hope everyone can see that. Cool, thanks, Tiff. Okay, so a 13-month-old is brought into ED by ambulance after a series of jerk-like movements, which lasted less than five minutes. Child is febrile with a temperature of 39 degrees and all other vitals are normal. What do you guys think? Oh, <laughs> febrile can not fall in. Very good. Um, so the giveaways there is that the child is between six months and six years. Uh, it's jerk-like movements, which indicate a seizure. The child's febrile, which is good. So you can make the link there about a febrile seizure. And then full septic screen is normal, meaning that it's not likely to be meningitis or encephalitis, which is important to rule out in somebody that's febrile and having a seizure. So febrile convulsions, just quickly, like how they work is that the inflammation from the infections that it releases causes the release of all these cytokines and inflammatory things that act on the hypothalamus and those, and that causes the seizure-like activity. And it's, it's the rapid change in temperature that's sort of believed to cause these febrile convulsions. Um, so something like roseola in phantom is a common cause of febrile convulsions. It's important when you're going through or trying to make a diagnosis of febrile convulsions that you rule out a past history of any seizure-like syndrome so that they're not that they haven't had a previous afebrile seizure. And then you also must rule out things like meningitis and encephalitis. Um, it's important as well that you sort of ask questions about if they've had any vaccines recently and just sort of check their immunization schedule because it might have been uh, this, this seizure or fever or whatever it might be, might be in relation to one of those vaccinations. Um, cool. In terms of, I guess, what you do for or what findings you'd want to know on an examination, you'd want to, the, the purpose of this is to mainly sort of either to one, rule out meningitis and two, rule, find the cause of the fever in, in whatever, in this child that's having this, this convulsion. So you look for things like rashes, um, you perform a RESP, GIT, cardio exam, um, and then you also look for things like altered consciousness, bulging fontanelles, like you can see in this little baby there. Uh, focal, any signs of any focal neurology um, and neck stiffness, which is hard to see in, in little kids, but they might be just sort of lying stiff and flat as opposed to moving around to, and, um, uh, to, to relieve some of that meningeal stretch. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of the, the workup for this, it really just depends on how old the child is and, and how unwell they are so if they're less than three months old and they have a fever you sort of usually do your full septic workup um, if they're over three months and well it's most likely i guess a uti or something like that so you can do your analysis reassurance and then gp follow up um, and if they're over three months and really unwell then a full septic workup is is and and, and, and empirical antibiotics are warranted but again that would be discussion with a, a senior member of staff and sort of go through it that way so getting a Um, in terms of management for this, so if it's if you it's a clear diagnosis of a of a febrile convulsion and it's you're not worried about anything else, then I guess you can put, uh, you go through conservative management, but it it does not reduce the the risk of uh, further sort of seizures as a part of this febrile episode. So antipyretics don't reduce the risk, and I'm sure you're probably aware of that. Um, in terms of I guess the overall management, though, you want to really make sure that you screen for a source of the fever, both in your OSCEs and, I guess, in real life, trying to find out what, what it is that's causing this febrile convulsion, because that's that's really important. And if you came along to the Muppets sort of OSCE night recently, you would have seen that we had a, 
a station where the child had an infection that resulted in in a in a febrile convulsion. All right, cool. Uh, there are a few questions. Oh, no, maybe no, I'll I'll get to. The, I can see a few questions popping up. I'll come back to them at the end if that's if that's okay. Um, okay, so meningitis. So meningitis you're all familiar with from 3V, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but the way that it presents in in younger kids, and um, Rachel sort of touched on this as well, is that, that high-pitched cry, they'll have a full fontanelle indicating increased ICP, um, they'll have a non-blanching rash, they, they don't have to, but they can, um, and then they'll they'll be lying flat, like I said before, to sort of minimize that meningeal stretch. Um, in older sort of adolescent kids, it'll be the same sort of signs as adults, so photophobia, neck sickness, headache, that kind of thing, um, classical signs of meninges and or meningitis. Um, so full septic screen is warranted if you're worried about this. And then the antibiotics you give are below there, um, and that's given based off of their age. Um, and again, same as for septic arthritis and a, and a joint aspirate, you, you don't really delay here for, a, for, a, for a, if you can't get an LP, you just give them the empirical antibiotics within 30 minutes. That's the, that's the main uh, definitive management. Okay, so this this is the, the complicated, I guess, part of, of, uh, of neuro that everyone sort of doesn't like, but it's, we had quite a few questions on our exam last year about all the different seizure syndromes. Like I think it was about three or four marks allocated to just like knowing the different um, types of epilepsy and things like that. So it's worthwhile knowing them. The good thing is though, if you if you know it, you'll get it right because it's, it's all like buzzwords, easy to remember. But um, if you don't know it, there's no way to figure it out. Uh, but just in general, epilepsy is just two or more unprovoked seizures more than 24 hours apart. Um, you can break that down into primary or secondary and it's usually primary, meaning that there's, it's idiopathic and there's no sort of aggravating factor that's causing these these uh, seizures um and it'll more likely be present from a young age so some of those infant seizure sorry seizure syndromes uh you can also be secondary so uh things like things that are due to tumors or mal malformations uh, cognitive um or neurological conditions uh, so things like down syndrome and, and, and cerebral palsy so these are the, the seizure syndromes, and I've just sort of tried to break them down into infant and adolescent seizure syndromes. And then, um, so in terms of the infant ones, the most common sort of one is West syndrome, or in, also known as infantile spasm. That happens between four and six months, and it's recurring tonic seizures, so increased tone, so that they'll be drawing up their legs, flinging out their arms, and sort of hunching over. Um, and it's usually associated with, with some sort of hypoxia early on. And the buzzword for that is a is a hips arrhythmia. Now, I mean that I remember that, and I don't know if you guys remember things like, you know, with mnemonics or whatever, but um, West syndrome is like the wild West and it's coming off of your hip, like, you know, how they do the shootouts. I can see Tiffany's laughing. So I hope the rest of you are laughing. I suspect none of you are laughing, but that's okay. Um and um, that's just the way I remember it. At least now I've said it, you'll remember it. Um, the next one sort of Lennox Gastaut syndrome, a uh, bit older, so kids that are between one and three years of age. Um, and it's atonic tonic seizures. So it's a, a limp, and that's the atonic phase of the seizure, and then a grip, and that's the tonic component of the seizure. Uh, and some of the associated sort of symptoms or, or findings that you might have in a child with this syndrome will be that they have neurodevelopmental delay so they won't have they won't might not necessarily meet their milestones um they probably have a history of of uh west syndrome in infancy and the buzzword there is um uh, on eeg you'll have one to slow to two slow hertz spike waves with paroxysms of fast activity now i don't i don't, I don't know what that means but that was I, i'm pretty sure that was in the exam where they said that so you know it's lennox um gas syndrome and it's a poorer prognosis, hence the uh, delayed developmental milestones. Um, okay, so those are the infant ones. There are a few more infant ones on the next slide, but I'll come to them. Um, then there's ad then there's adolescent seizure sy seizure syndrome. So there's benign Rolandic epilepsy, and this one sort of happens in the central temporal sort of region of the brain. Uh, there's an auto autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, so it might say something in the stem about a family history. Uh, but it usually remits, so that usually 
won't progress into teenage years. So it's, it, it, it limits itself in that way. Um, then there's temporal lobe epilepsy. And so these ones are classically, you get the symptoms of sort of deja vu, uh, disordered taste, smell, visual hallucinations. Uh, and they don't really have a, an impact, a major impact on life either. They sort of remit with, with teenage years. Uh, cool. All right, then there's absence seizures and tonic-clonic seizures. Um, so childhood absence seizures, they have that sort of three hertz spike wave on EEG. Um, it'll in the STEM last year it was something about a, a teacher bringing it to the attention of the parents that their child stares blankly in class, um, and can it can also be triggered by hyperventilation. So if it has any of those things, you know it's sort of childhood absence epilepsy. These ones, absence epilepsy is, is a bit easier to pick up on an exam question because it'll be very clear that they're blanking out or staring blankly. So that's not too bad. Um, adolescence absence epilepsy is uh, the same thing, but it's poorer prognosis. And it happens in older kids uh, in adolescence. Um, and it can progress to tonic clonic seizures. So, in terms of tonic clonic seizures, there's three sort of syndromes you need to know there's myoclonic epilepsy, also known as ju juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Uh, and it's just myoclonic uh, is where it's sort of jerking movements. So, it's also called throwing plate syndrome because, like, the hand will sort of move back and forth and they'll might fling a plate. Um, anterior spike waves on EEG and triggered by uh, sleep deprivation. Uh, and if you do get, uh, it'd be pretty harsh to get something about epilepsy or seizures or something like that for an OSCE. But if you did, it'd be a, just a good point to sort of ask about uh, developmental milestones or delays. And also just if there's any triggers that the parents have noticed that happen in association with these um, uh, seizures. Just a little tip. Uh, then there's photosensitivity epilepsy, which I'm sure you guys all know about. That's why a lot of movies and things have warnings about flashing lights. So this one's triggered by flashing lights and it causes tonic-clonic seizures, but it's well controlled with medications and doesn't have too much of an impact on, on the child's life. And then this last one, Dravet syndrome, that one's got a really poor prognosis and the, the buzzword or the thing for this will be that the child suddenly passes away, which is quite sad, but that's the, that's that syndrome. I know that's a lot there and it's probably just best that you just go through these and just sort of try and memorize them, which is sad, which is a sad way to learn this, but it's just how it is. It's just so complicated. Um, but in terms of seizures, you should probably know like the different types of seizures and how they're managed. So a focal seizure will have mainly sensory disturbances, whereas a generalized seizure will have more motor symptoms. So any of those tonic, atonic, myoclonic and tonic clonic seizures and and you can classify absent seizures under generalized seizures but um, they're managed differently so i just broke it out and so that's the more bl blanking out staring daydreaming um and they might have lip smacking and hand flapping but the way that you manage it is there below there and you you need to know that um as well the order of how the agents are oh, sorry the um yeah the order and and, and what uh, agent is used for each seizure Status epilepticus. So this is a seizure for more than five minutes or two seizures uh, within a five minute period um, without a return to baseline. So there'll be some sort of uh, neurological deficit in that period um, indicating that the child has not gone back to baseline. And the way that you manage that is is by using this flow chart or you can just sort of remember what I've written there. So it's, it's a dose of midazolam or, or benzo. It's a dose of some sort of benzo. Then you repeat that after five minutes with another benzo then if it's if they're still seizing then you give them a second line agent still seizing you give them an alternative second line agent and then you move to your third line agents and so forth i hope that makes sense it's, it's relatively straightforward but i think you do have to remember the order of those things okay so cerebral palsy so it's it's um you don't have to know the types but it's just if you if you wanted to you can just just to get your head around it it's a bit easier to contextualize but it's it's a non-degenerative developmental disability which means that whatever deficit you have as a uh, as a child when you're born is going to be the the dis disability that you can sort of overcome and, and have to deal with um as the child gets older it's it's non it doesn't progress or it doesn't get worse um and it's mostly motor but there can be intellectual um disabilities as a result of of cerebral palsy as well um, and the insult that results in cerebral palsy can be prenatal, um, 
perinatal or postnatal. And I broke, I've, um, I have a table in the next slide that talks about each one in a bit more detail. Um, in terms of the symptoms, they, they, uh, they, or, or the symptoms or risk factors, they might be premature, or that might be in the stem that it's a premature child with a difficult birth, or there are some birth associated complications. They might have delayed motor milestones and they might be, um, uh, there might be some asymmetric uncoordinated movement and and children early on don't have a hand dominance like they're not you're not gonna be able to say that they're left-handed or right-handed or or whatever it might be but it might be that um uh, they uh it might just be that they can't use their other hand so they use their left hand a lot so that's what i mean by early hand dominance there um and you don't have to remember all of these associations but it just just keep in mind that there will be other sort of disabilities or deficits that the child might have that might be in the stem. So I might say that they also have epilepsy or um, they're not putting on as much weight or they have chronic constipation or something like that. Um, and then these are just, you don't have to know all of these, but just, just knowing that um, there are risk factors or these are the usual causes to, to that, that might result in someone having cerebral palsy. Um, and I'll just leave it there. You don't have to memorize that all or anything but yeah um and then one i guess is the one last thing is just breath holding spells so um these happen in kids between the, usually between the ages of six months and six years and it's after a uh, you know after they get a shock or they're afraid or they stub their toe on something so it's um, nothing major but something simple and it results in them sort of holding their breath so there's two types so there's the cyanotic type and then just the pale type. So the, the blue type or the cyanotic type, they cry, and they breathe out really forcefully, then they hold their breath and they go blue around their lips and they might sort of faint or go a bit floppy. Um, and it's not necessarily a seizure, but can be mistaken mistaken for a seizure. Um, so it's just really important to, to ask about that sort of jerk black movements or um, seizing movements just to rule that out. Um, and then children can also be, can also go through like a, a pale, sort of spell where they hold their breath and they go pale as a result of bradycardia. Uh, so they try to cry, but they don't really cry. And then they faint. Um, and then they sort of become, they can uh, become incontinent and have stiff arms, but you don't really need to do anything to treat them. It's a reassurance, safety netting, and then a follow up. Okay. So um, these two, I think there are ones. Yeah. Uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So that's an X-linked condition and it's caused by the lack of a, a protein called dystrophin, um, which really sort of controls or uh, regulates how much calcium can come into a cell. Uh, and if you have a lack of this due to a mutation, you get ongoing depolarization of the cell um, and then on and regeneration. And eventually when you get um, regeneration, sorry, sorry, degeneration exceeding regeneration, you get uh, necrosis. And the muscle tissue is then replaced by adipose tissue as a result. Um, so when that happens, you get weak muscles. So you, people can't stand up. So you get gouges sign, which is sort of a buzzword where they use their um, they use their upper limbs to push off from their lower limbs to get from sitting down or lying down to standing. And they also get pseudo hypertrophy because of the adipose tissue depositing in their in, in their um, in their muscles. So you get really big carbs and things like that. But because this affects, um, because dystrophin is needed for all types of muscle and, and neuronal tissue, it can also cause learning difficulties, decreased reflexes, and can be associated with things like autism spectrum disorder as well. Um, it can affect smooth muscles, so you can get delayed transit, so GIT disorders, um, and then if it affects cardiac muscle, you can get things like cardiac myopathy. Um, but the way to diagnose is this, you can screen for it with um, elevated uh, CK levels. So it'll be 50 to 100 times higher than the normal limits. Um, but then you can ultimately just sort of diagnose it with, with either a muscle biopsy or genetic testing. Um, but there's no cure for it. Um, and it's mainly just physio, OT, and, and, and regular sort of follow-up and monitoring. But they have a, a reduced life expectancy of about 30 to 40 years as well. Um, SMA, I don't think it's ever ever come up on an exam, but it, I think it's just good maybe because it is on the matrix. So it's good to be aware of, but it's just degeneration of your, the anterior um, horn cells in the spinal cord. 
and it causes progressive muscle weakness and sort of atrophy. And it's uh, there'll be a family history of it in the stem because it's caused by it being autosomal recessive. So that might be a giveaway there. And it doesn't affect the cranial nerves that are responsible for movement of the eye. Um, it spares those for, for whatever reason. Um, but there's different types. So type 1, they can't move their head and they can't sit up. Type 2, they can't stand up alone. And then type 3, they can walk, but they will have... Um, things like joint aches and cramps and things like that. But it's the same thing. The CK levels will be slightly elevated, not as much as in the, um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, but still elevated, and then can be diagnosed with a, with a muscle biopsy or with genetic testing. I won't go through these ones because they're not really, I don't know if they come up all that much, but it's just good to just, I'll, I'll have the information and you can sort of read through it and um, just remember a few things about each condition. Um, but then these ones really, these buzzwords can help a lot if you struggling with 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 time or you have other things to sort of memorize in a pinch this might be able to this might be something that helps you and i, I just leave them there in the, in the slides cool okay i'll just go through there were a few questions oh someone's asked this is worth memorizing the eeg patterns depends on how you want to remember the seizure syndromes um if, if there's other ways that you want to remember them and you find that that'll, that'll help, I think, yeah, sure, you don't have to memorize them. But I think for our questions, they all had the EEG patterns on them, which really helped with picking apart which one each one was. So I don't know. Ataxic telangiectasia. Louise is around. Louise, do you, do you want to explain ataxic telangiectasia and Frederick's a taxi. I'll just send that question to Louise because I'm not too sure if that's worth memorizing. One second. Yeah, you can send me the question. I'll have a look at it. Thank you. Oh. Another question about whether it's worthwhile remembering the patterns of inheritance for things. Yeah, so I'll we'll go through that tomorrow in the uh, genetics component of the of the lectures. Um, I think it is worth remembering that because that can help sometimes with diagnosing a condition. I don't think remembering that alone is going to be enough for knowing what each condition is because like that's not going to really narrow it down, but it can help. Uh, I'll go through that tomorrow and then we can talk about that more. Um, Oh, okay. Um, someone's asking about uh, positive pressure ventilation and continuous positive airway pressure between CPAP and PPV. I think PPV is intermittent. It's not sort of c c continuous, like how they use the, um, like, uh, if that's your question, like in a CPAP mask. So w I think what Rachel was talking about when she was talking about neonatal resus and giving breaths, it's just a few breaths. It's not that you continuously... Uh, provide positive pressure. Is that what, sorry, is that what you mean? Oh, oh perfect, cool, no worries. Um, Louise, anything on, on that ATAX, if, if they need to know about ataxia telangiectasia? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, pardon me. There was like, I remember there was like one question on it one year, but um, I wouldn't bother learning it. <clears throat> it's just um, like an autosomal recessive mutation in a DNA repair gene. Um, so it, it's associated with um, growth hormone deficiency. So I think that's how it kind of came up. So they've like got growth retardation. Um, and then that's also associated with premature aging as well. Um so yeah it's a it's just a weird like one of those weird and wonderful things I think they had like one question on it one year but we didn't get any questions on it so I wouldn't bother um and then Frederick's ataxia um I'm fairly sure from memory but I would look this up is just one of those 
um, like perif- inherited, one of the most common inherited peripheral neuropathies. Um, so I guess it just kind of comes under the umbrella term for that. Um, but again, pretty weird and wonderful. And I don't think it comes up in peds all that often. I hope that kind of helped. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for that. No, that was good. Um, do you have any suggestions in your priority of questions to do for the exam? Um, would it be Muppets, Moodle, or past exams? Um, in terms of resources, I know the Muppets ones are really good if you have time to to go through them, but also the past exams are are, are really good too. So I, yeah, I think I'd go through through I guess the Muppets exams and the past exams to get a good idea of what um, to expect on the real exam. Um, yeah. Or even just going through the the Muppets buzzwords. Um, yeah, I think I think it's still Rupert that's writing your exams. I'm not entirely sure. Um, you guys probably know know more than we do in terms of who's writing your exams and what's all up with all that. But um, if it's Rupert that's still doing it, it it'll still be fairly buzzwordy. Um, and and that's not to be like, oh, Rupert. Rupert's just very kind. He's just a very nice man, and he he wants you all to pass and enjoy peds and do well. So, um, I wouldn't stress too much about the the peds exam the average last year was like 90 percent or something crazy like that so everyone usually does generally well that's not to say don't study because i'm sure all those people last year studied but you get what i mean any other questions i'm sure i've missed a few sorry and if i have please send them again or we can go through them again tomorrow because we'll i'll be here tomorrow as well um Oh, is benign occipital different to temporal? I think it's the, I'm pretty sure it's the same. Isn't it, Louise? Sorry, I'm throwing Louise under the bus here. I, I... <laughs> What's this for, sorry? Um, is benign occipital different to temporal lobe epilepsy? Yeah, occipital, are we talking about, yeah, like partial, yeah, yeah, so occipital is going to be, so with your um, complex partial seizures, um, they're, they're like focal in which you can tell from like the aura, like where it's coming from, so like an occipital seizure is going to have visual things, so like before the seizure happens, they may describe like a scotoma or like flushes and floaters or something visual related. And then they will, then in the post-ictal state, they can even have like post-ictal blindness. So occipital, you're just thinking like visual things. And then temporal is like really, really classic and really, really common. And they will have the auras like the deja vu and the jamais vu. um, And they can have like abdominal symptoms as well, like abdominal pain or feeling of nausea and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, they, they're definitely, they're definitely different. Um, yeah. All right. And then someone else is, thank you, Louise. Someone else has asked if, um, the exams last year were generally buzzwordy. I think the peds ones definitely were, the other ones were definitely not. Um, would you say that that's fair, Louise? Yeah. Um, the peds ones was, um, it was literally like I had seen all of, like, majority of the questions before, like, word for word, and you could, you didn't really have to think much, and that exam was very, very kind, because it just came off the back of women's, where your brain's, like, dying, Um, so peds, if you, I think, just do past exams, and you will smash it, Um, and then buzzwords, definitely, like, the buzzwords we've all said today will most likely come up in your exams, um, and before when we're talking about do you need to know the um the like the epilepsy like waveforms and stuff again I think it's just good because then it can help you answer the question quicker because you can be like yes that's related to that yes that's related to that um yeah whereas the other exams um aren't as buzzwordy and require yeah more complex thinking <laughs> yeah it's a bit bit rough but at least you have the peds paper to carry you through the the women's health section. At least that's how that's what I, that's how I approached it. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, is JME the only myoclonic seizure we need to know about? Uh, I think so. I think the only ones that you need to know about are the ones 
that I've um, put up on the on the slides there. I don't think there were any any other ones. I'll just look back, sorry, just to make sure. Yeah, that's the that's the only one you need to know. I think so. Oh, what was uh, the women's paper like? Any tips for revising? Oh, I, I don't know if we can get into all that. That might be that may be more wisdom's territory. But any the the biggest tip for revising for that would be the prompt guidelines. Um, and Louise did really well on that paper as well. So I don't know if she wants to say anything about that or or back up my um, prompt tip. But definitely go through the prompt guidelines. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, sadly, it's all prompt, um, which is I think is absolutely freaking stupid because that's just like one hospital's guidelines. Um, but it is. It's just prompt. So and past papers always do past papers. Um, yeah, and and good luck. <laughs> Women's is difficult. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you for that, everyone. Um, if there are no more questions, I mean, we'll be there tomorrow as well. Um, I'll make sure Louise comes along. <laughs> um, all right, cool. Thanks, everyone.